Checking. Ladies and gentlemen, a hearty welcome to one and all for attending the World Conference on Multidisciplinary Research and Innovation, WCMRI 2022. Please stand up for the national anthem.
चुपेंगे किस खाते चुपेंगे Thank you all. Good morning all. I enhance a warm welcome to the World Conference on Multidisciplinary Research and Innovation, WCMRI 2022, organized by the Institute of Engineering Research and Publication in association with the Karpaga Vinayaga College of Engineering and Technology. This conference will offer researchers, delegates, and scholars an incredible chance to interact with each other and share their experiences and knowledge of technology applications. Now, I would like to share a few words about the IFERP. The Institute of Engineering Research and Publication is one of the world's largest non-profitable professional associations meant for research development and promotion in the field of engineering and technology. We are a platform to promote the advancement and dissemination of the knowledge of engineering and technology. IFERP is a professional association and a forum where innovations and research interests could be supported and developed, prioritizing our mutual interest. Our forums and associates constitute of professional leaders and organizations connecting each other with a mission to work as wizards of science for defending the earth. IFERP provides a world-class platform for scientists, researchers, academicians, business figures by organizing conferences and publication research articles. IFERP conferences bring together professional wizards and leaders who have explored all avenues to reinforce the field of applied science, engineering, and technology. We shall now play, we shall now play a short video regarding IFERP.
Welcome to IFERP, a forum where innovations and research interest could be supported and developed, prioritizing our mutual interest. In this video, we want you to dive into our world, giving yourself a clear insight into IFERP. But first, who are we and what do we do? Institute for Engineering Research and Publication, IFERP for short, is one of the world's largest non-profitable professional associations operating under the Techno Arena Research and Development Association, TRADA, meant for research and development in the field of engineering, science and technology. We are one of the largest professional bodies for engineering professionals in India and across the globe, established in 2014. We extend to every part of the globe, with more than 28,000 professional members and 34,000 student members. Our growing membership at IFERP has led to an increase in members from Europe, Asia, Australia, Africa and the USA, fostering networking opportunities that strengthen ties within and across countries and technical communities. The mission of IFERP is to connect professionals at an integrated platform for growth to divert knowledge and skills towards the sustainable application of professional education and more. And our vision of digitalizing innovation processes through our professional networking services and more has pushed us forward to our achievements today. With our mission to make our academic services reach the top and grassroots level of institutions, we are funding colleges to organize conferences and scientific events, enabling researchers incubated at different areas of our country to directly contribute towards the transformation of India. IFERP simply connects engineers, exchange global innovation and acts as a bridge between researchers and academics by organizing international conferences, world conferences, faculty development programs, webinars, seminars, providing membership and more. Some of our conferences include WCASET Malaysia, WCASET Jakarta, ICASETAM APU Malaysia and many more. We've also organized scientific events in association with renowned universities done in the past with over 28,593 journal publication services, creating opportunities to get your research paper published in high impact factor journals such as Scopus Indexed, Web of Science, Google Scholar Index Journals, ESCI, UGC Approved, El Compandax, ISI, Chimago Index Journals and many more. To make our operations smoother and more perfect, we have been supported by our associated organization, Association of Cloud Technologists, Global Association of Nanotechnology, International Association for Big Data Analysts, International Association for IoT, International Wireless Network Association, and World Association for Structural Engineers. We have also worked alongside several clients and partners, both nationally and internationally, like University Malaysia Sabah, APU Malaysia, UNJ Jakarta, MC University Thailand, Ajman University Dubai, PUP Philippines, IIUM Malaysia, ISU Philippines, FCPC Philippines, WCC Philippines SRM University, Galgotia University, Amity University and much more government and private organizations in different countries. At IFERP, we believe that there's always a better way to treat professionals, and that is what we do. If you would like to see more or go deeper on IFERP, you can visit our website at www.iferp.in. Thank you. And now I would like to present that our incredible IFERP application has been officially launched. It is now available for curious scientific researchers. It is presented as a delightful platform for academic and research breakthroughs, which you can now get it from the Google Play Store for any upcoming conference updates. A short video will be played regarding it.
Thank you. I would like to share a few words about Karpaga Vinayaga Educational Group. Karpaga Vinayaga Educational Group 2001 caters to various disciplines of education like medicine, dentistry, engineering, nursing, and allied science, health sciences. Karpaga Vinayaga College of Engineering and Technology was established in the year 2001, approved by AICTE New Delhi and affiliated with Anna University Chennai. KVEG campus is away from the hustle and bustle of the city, but close in proximity to the scene. The campus holds dedicated and well-qualified faculty members, well-planned lecture halls, computer centers, libraries, laboratories, auditorium, and above all, quality education is provided to cater the needs of this competitive field. I would like to highlight a few words about WCMRI. The World Conference on Multidisciplinary Research and Innovation, WCMRI 2022, provides a premier interdisciplinary platform for researchers, practitioners, and educators to present and discuss the most recent innovations. It also allows to discuss about the trends and concerns as well as practical challenges encountered and solutions adopted in the fields of education, research, social science, and humanities. I would like to invite all our honorable dignitaries for today. Firstly, I would like to welcome our special guests, Mr. Sid Kumar Charger, MD and founder of Technorate Groups, Dr. P. Valiangiri, Dr. Santosh B. Rane, and Dr. Delshi Hausalya Devi R. Next, I would like to invite our eminent keynote speakers, Mr. Scott Newton, Dr. Ipsita Ananda, Dr. Manju Gupta, and Dr. Sharda Purohit. I would also like to invite our session chair, Dr. Sanya Kenafum. I now request Dr. Sharda Purohit and Dr. Manju Gupta and Mr. and Dr. P. Valiangiri to kindly uh, please do the proceedings for the book release. On behalf of all our dignitaries and participants, we are happy to release our World Conference on Multidisciplinary Research and Innovation, WCMRI 2022, organized by the Institute of Engineering Research and Publications in association with Karpaga Vinayaga College of Engineering and Technology. Can you please have a big round of applause, please? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. I would now like to invite a special guest speaker, Mr. Sid Kumar Charger, founder and managing director of Technorate Groups. Mr. Sid Kumar Charger is an entrepreneur, investor, philanthropist, founder, and managing director of Technorate Group. He had eight years of experience in organizing scientific conferences. He completed his education in engineering from SRM University, Chennai, and his MBA from St. Peter's University, Chennai. He is interested in doing several socio-academic activities for the welfare of the society. Under his guidance, IFERP became one of the fastest growing organizations in Asia. His organization received the best scientific conference production house of 2018 from ABP. With success knowing no limits, Mr. Sid attributes his fame to teamwork and the entrepreneurship spirit, which together have enabled transformation of risk to opportunities and to handle the ever-changing environment in education and technologies. 
I now request Mr. Sid Kumar Chajo to kindly deliver his welcome address. Thank you for your warm welcome. Uh, very good morning to distinguished guests, eminent scholars, delegates, committee members, participants, and students. On behalf of IFRP, it is a great pleasure indeed for me to welcome all the delegates, speakers, session chairs, committee members, academician, young researchers, participants, and students all around the globe from different walk of life who joined here to share their knowledge and vast experience in this impressive World Conference on Multidisciplinary Research and Innovation. Organized by IFERP in associated with Karpagam Vinayagam College of Engineering and Technology, Chennai, with the theme of pursuing a critical um, stance at the foreign economy, culture, and academic policies that are impacting innovation in multidisciplinary research worldwide. It is a great honor for me to welcome our special guest, Dr. Santosh B. Rane, faculty and former dean academics, Sardar Patil College of Engineering, Mumbai, and Dr. Velinger, Osmania University, Hyderabad. On this special occasion, I am very grateful to express my deep appreciation to our eminent speakers who have joined here to share their knowledge and vast experience with the student community. I welcome our keynote and invited speaker, Mr. Scott Newton, Managing Partner, Thinking Dimension Global Consulting, Milan, Italy. Professor Dilip Nankalia, Co-Chancellor, Advisory Board Member at QNH Global Certification, Commonwealth University, Maharashtra. Dr. Ifshita Nanda, Dean, Faculty of Information Technology, Gopal Narayana Singh, University, Bihar. Dr. Rajkumar Singh, Chairperson, Center for Entrepreneurship, Innovation and Skill Development of SMS Varanasi. Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, wow. Technical University, Lucknow, India. And Dr. Manju Gupta, Director, Strategic Management, Mangalme uh -huh. Group of Engineers. Uh -huh. Porte, po, po, Portite, Private Limited, Uttar Pradesh, India. Next, I would like uh -huh. to welcome our session speaker, Dr. Sharda Prohit, Associate Professor, Noida. Uh, Dr. Jyoti, Faculty and of Engineering and Technology Department of Computer Science and Technology, Ramya University of Applied Science, Bangalore. Along with our speakers, I welcome all the, our advisory board members, committees, delegates, participants, and students for this fruitful WFC MRI 2022, who present both breadth and excellence in industry experience in universities, research, and in government policy, making and reflect their broad interest, excitement, and concern across society in how research, innovation, and technology will influence our shared future. I wish you the most productive days filled with thought-provoking conversation. I sincerely hope that this conference will be a huge success, not only as a venue for exchanging knowledge and expertise in multidisciplinary research and innovation, but also as the start of a long and fruitful collaboration and friendship between fellow educators committed to the most important and, and worthwhile the task of technology, teaching, and training, our future leaders, the youth. I believe the majority of us would concur that every previous technological waves has ultimately created more jobs than it has eliminated. Additionally, every previous technology wave brought about significant in, uh, improvement in practically every aspect of contemporary life including higher living standard, longer lifespan, lower rates of disease, improved communication, increased productivity, and ec economic expansion. This time, we must deliberately and proactively rethinking the nature of employment if we want to advance our technology to benefit everyone. The future of work needs to be reinvented as a collective society's effort and long-term solution will require creativity and initiativity 
from all corners of society. It should be a top concern for everyone who is aspiring to profit from a society that is healthy and stable because it provides opportunity for everyone. Solving this problem effectively may be one of the most significant and inspirational challenge of our time. One of the fundamental purpose of contemporary educational curriculum is the development of human resource and equipping of them with financial and economical knowledge and ability. This, um, this crucial role was recognized by those in charge of creating curriculum at the educational center for research and development. It is my hope that this the World Conference on Multidisciplinary Research and Innovation would be able to achieve its objective in providing an effective forum for academician research and practitioner to advancing knowledge, research and technology for humanity. There has always been a gap between people and communities who can make effective use of research, innovation and technology and those who cannot. I believe IFRP can continue to be leader in this work of reducing the gap between student, academician and industry by acting as a bridge between academy and industry. And I hope many of you will seize the opportunity to join us. As a result, the organizing the conference IFRP hopes to set the perfect platform for participants to establish a career as successful and globally renowned specialist in the field of multidisciplinary research, innovation, and technology. While concluding, I would like to welcome all conference participants who are awaiting to share their knowledge and experience and to explore better way of educating our future leader. I take this opportunity to welcome each one of you and express our gratitude in your agreeing to participate in this conference. To put a conference of this magnitude together is not a small task to the tent. I would like to welcome um, and my sincere gratitude to all coordinators, organizing committee members, and session chairs. And, and I welcome once again on behalf of entire IFRP group for this World Conference on Multidisciplinary Research and Innovation. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to be a wonderful a scientific event. I wish to engaging and productive conference participation. Thank you. invite our guest speaker, Dr. P. Valiangiri, Professor Emirates from Osmania University, India. Mr. Dr. P. Valiangiri is an Emirates professor in the Department of Tamil from Osmania University, Hyderabad. Sir, can we please have a few words? अगर हम मुदला ये रित्तल्ला आदि भगवान मुदत्रे उलगे अनेवरकुम वनकम द मेन पर्पस ऑफ़ दिस कॉन्फ्रेंस इज़ बायोटेक्नोलॉजी हरी बायो इंजीनियरिंग दैट मीन या Everything is moving and everything is created and everything is for, for, is for the bio only. What is the most big thing that is cosmos? From the, from the cosmos, universe. From the universe, galaxies. From the galaxies, stars. From the stars, bovanas, planets are existing.
இந்த டோட்டல் காஸ்மஸ் இஸ் வெரி 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 பிக் ஒன் வி கான்ட் இமேஜின் தட் ஒன் இந்த காஸ்மஸ் there is total three things are existing one god second life that is bio then the matter only these three things are eternal god this bio then the matter we are concentrating about now the bio in in tamil it is uyir there is no word in english for life they are saying life only but we the but indians are very very great great knowledge in the, about this all these things in the bio life star existing only in the only in the particular world our world 84 lakhs types total 84 lakhs types of bio that means from plant tree to human in the nine humans are nine lakhs types now only we have nine lakh types of humans in this world in this world the life will stand for 864 years one life that means for man particularly for man it will it can stand for live for 864 years but we are not seeing a single man for 864 years but the nature divided 864 divided by 7 that means one man's life is 123 years men's life is minimum 123 life in that the life is going in this in this bhavana this in this earth the earth is then it is going to poor logam then super logam it is rotate going there in this three world only the life is going in this three world only in this 864 years circle for example our guru Srimad Sivanyana Baliya Swamigal lived nearly 800 years the next guru he lived 430 years how it is possible they lived this is bioengineering they created the engine in the body in the engineering so that they lived it is not story you can go to the web how can to live 1000 years you can see that summary it is written by living canadian professor it, it is not a joke it is not a story he is proving in his whole life he is doing this research only you see in the web so that we are 
living to a good life only for that this bio engineering engineering is very important this is our central idea of this seminar so you are going to reveal all these things but i to now narrated whole of this thing in my paper i will explain all of these things in that session please listen there thank you very much thank you so much sir we now proceed to inviting our keynote speaker dr manju gupta director of strategic management mangalme group of institutions and managing director in portate private limited greater noida uttar pradesh india Dr Manju Gupta PhD is an academician innovator mentor influencer and entrepreneur she is currently holding the position of director strategic management mangalme group of institutions managing director portate private limited and head strategic in, uh, initiatives she is the chairperson of center of excellence for innovation and skill development she is the member of various academic advisory cell chief editor of an international journal she has over 22 years of rich multicultural experience with education industry having strong credentials in rolling out initiative and innovative teaching methods online trainings business strategies operational excellence across diverse functional disciplines she is the recipient of various award as well as the prestigious power women award World Book of Records London 2021 I welcome you ma'am Good morning everyone So she already have given my introduction I am Dr Manju Gupta so I am director for an engineering and management institution from India So uh, I mean on this occasion I first you know uh, congratulate to the organizer who have organized this wonderful conference at you know Singapore and this is my first visit in singapore i was very excited to come here and to see this beautiful city and country so on this occasion of course i mean i would really congratulate to all the participants who have contributed their research paper and who have come here to present their research so i'm sure this is going to be very exciting that what new research and innovation is coming out of this conference and i must you know wish to mr sidh uh, sidh kumar chaja uh, professor velon giri Dr. Ipsita Nanda and Dr. Sandesh Rani, Mr. Scott Newton, Dr. Shraddha Purohit, those who are being invited as a keynote speaker and you know the chief guest for the entire day today. So my topic for the session is about artificial intelligence. You no, know? nowadays everybody is talking about artificial intelligence and blockchain. Now, how this artificial intelligence is changing the entire you know uh, placement industry in global perspective. So I think I'm going to discuss about it. and definitely i'm looking forward that i get more input from you people also so that we can discuss more about it how this industry is you know changing and how artificial intelligence is playing a very vital role so can you open my ppt yeah So topic for the day is artificial intelligence application and employment generation a global perspective So my research is about how the human trait to think rationally act purposefully and deal efficiently with the environment is called intelligence 
the straight is shown by the machine it is called as artificial intelligence we all know what is intelligence but then we are talking here about artificial intelligence any intelligence which is performed by machine is called as artificial intelligence the machine robot or automation now everybody knows that how robots are you know working in mines and different industries and sectors so the algorithm which we use for artificial neural network has been developed and its optimization by very large data we call it as a deep learning which work as a brain we will discuss in the entire you know presentation today okay so now the significant application for image processing character recognition and forecasting in different sector like agriculture industry mining education healthcare electrical engineering and outer space research and aerospace engineering have been enumerated i am sure now we all know that how artificial intelligence have entered into all sector beat healthcare or it is you know agriculture or even education during the time of pandemic or corona we all have witnessed that really i mean this was really really very tough you know the challenging time for everyone but then because of the artificial intelligence we were very very much you know uh, comfortable that how we can diagnose the problem because i will be discussing about that also so the implication of artificial you know intelligence on employment have been discussed at length and it has been concluded that the productivity effect will dominate and ai will generate more jobs so basically it is a challenge so i will not only discuss about the positive implication there are negative implication as well no ai is producing more job but then ai is reducing the job also that how it is reducing the job that i will also discuss but how it is giving the positive implication in the industry from the student perspective and across the global perspective next please so uh, the basic introduction is the artificial intelligence is referred to a computer science technique i am sure you all must be aware that it is a technique which is related to a computer science and it is a technology that allow computer or software to exhibit smart in other words to do things that seem human like so when you know artificial intelligence work i am sure everybody have seen the chatbots nowadays right whenever we work in any of the website there are so many chatbots who are working siri is one of the example siri is also a chatbot we get feeling that i mean it is a real uh, you know a kind of word experience we are getting so uh, it is really a very very broader term so lot of research is already going on and of course we need to do more and more research into this area so before going into the depth of the subject we should understand that what exactly the algorithm is and how this artificial neural network works so uh, i am sure every researcher is already working on you know writing algorithm for their own analysis so algorithm is basically a computer science or mathematics or it is a finite sequence of well defined computer instructions typically to solve a problem so in order to solve any of the problem we need to write instruction in a very very systematic manner so when we write you know instruction in a systematic manner that is called as an algorithm i'm just taking an example when you have to prepare a cup of tea so when we prepare a cup of tea you need to follow certain process that you need to take water then boil the water add tea leaves and then add sugar milk and then you know the tea is ready so this is a process i mean there is a flow chart so this is basically called as the algorithm similarly in case of ai Uh, the entire computer system work entire software industry i mean software work in terms of ai is based on the algorithms so now what this artif uh, neural network is so neural network is basic neural is what our brain is an interconnected network right similarly neural network is a interconnected group of nodes akin to vast network of neurons in the human brain so human brain is comprises of various neurons right so how this neural network works with the help of machine learning language so machine learning is a subset of ai so when we write any of the algorithm in ai ai works with machine learning right so machine learning is a language which is used to write algorithm for artificial intelligence so ml refers to a set of techniques which allow us to create ai softwares by training their software with data to displays desired kind of intelligent you know inputs or maybe information so when we want to get any of the information we need to feed the data so how we are giving the data i mean that depend i mean accuracy will be dis, uh, dependent on the data what kind of data we are providing similarly in any of the research when you really want to find out the findings or the accuracy of the research then your data has to be accurate your sample size has to be apt to do any kind of research so similarly in case of machine learning 
when we write i mean in case of uh, ai when we want to write any program or software the uh, that need to be work into machine learning right machine learning is a basically language for ai so all the interesting activity in ai has to be done through the machine learning only so now the important term is cognitive computing this is basically to highlight the capability to humans higher level of thinking so i personally feel as a you know it person or even a researcher so whatever we are doing in terms of even technicalities the entire algorithm has been written by the human so artificial intelligence can never be beyond the human intelligence right human intelligence is far far superior than the artificial intelligence why because the entire algorithm process has been done by the human brain only which but then ai work as a human brain neurons so accordingly we are working on so i'll be giving an example to determine the sentiment expressed in text or images or what object we can present in pictures so whenever you look at any of the picture so immediately your sensor sense that what this picture is all about so that means your neurons brains that neurons are active but this you know this is possible only through the sensory organ which is you know uh, playing a important role similarly the robots are basically a software program which has been written uh, you know uh, which has been algorithm by the software engineer in terms of the language which has been used by the machine learning so ai uh, now uh, i mean why i am talking about all this terminology because to understand the concept of ai these terms are very very important so if you talk about big data i'm sure you must have heard about the big data now everybody is talking about big data machine learning python artificial intelligence blockchain so these are very very big important buzzword in the industry so we should know that how we can do more and more collaborative research by using all these technicalities so uh, either you are doing a primary research or you are doing a empirical study so when we are doing a you know primary research then of course you need to take the help of these tools or application to make your research more and more effective so big data is basically how ai you know or cognitive computing relate to big data so data is used to train the machine definitely machine will not work without data so in order to perform any of the task into machine you need to provide the data so uh, whatever i mean data has to be accurate data has to be valuable so that you can get the accuracy of the information now chatbot i already explained next is industrial internet of things i am sure you must have you know uh, heard this term also iot internet of things which is a network that connect collect communicate and monitor device to enhance industrial processes if you talk about cloud computing nowadays you see that there is a vast variety of data data is coming from various sources you are always on social media when you are on social media data is coming from different different sphere data is coming from different mindset right now there is a big challenge how this data to be analyzed which is very important right say for example any of the marketing professor must be here so when you find the, when you do the marketing research right when we do the marketing research in that case we need to collect the data so based on the data we find that this product would be successful in the market or not so that data has to be accurate but how you can predict predict the accuracy of the data because whenever we go into any of the shopping mall you see that there are so many salesmen who comes near you and they say that you just give your data right you, there there must be certain questionnaire you need to fill that questionnaire but honestly how many people are here who do the right you know filling of the questionnaires okay we do just random click right so that means when we are doing the random click that means the data accuracy will not be there so in that case this cognitive computing or maybe ai is taking the part ai work on the human brains so cloud computing is basically a practice of using a remote server hosted on the internet now everybody knows that when we are doing internet banking or any of the you know hybrid learning or even online learning cloud computing is playing a very very vital role because server is at one location and we are working at different location then server is a centralized you know server across various countries so this is only possible through the cloud computing next next is deep learning so when we work on neural network project you know typically we work with few thousand to few millions of you know units and millions of connections 
I'm just taking an example of Facebook or maybe Twitter or even LinkedIn. So there are millions of connections, right? And these millions of connections are working with a different mindset and different brains, right? There are different kind of units. So we call it as a deep learning. So because of multiple intermediate hidden layers, they have. So how deep learning neutral network are, uh, you know, uh, working on complex, uh, which is more than the complex than the human brain. So how this computing work as a, so this computing work based on the deep learning only. Next is augmenting reality. I'm sure you must, whenever you visit to any of the shopping mall, you see that there is a virtual corner where your kids play. You know, there are so many uh, uh, augmented reality based videos and, you know, games and they feel that they are into the real world, right? That is called as the augmented reality and virtual reality. So virtual reality is basically a simulated environment, which is similar to a real world. So sometime when you went into the virtual environment, you feel that you are really, really into the real world because it is so much similarized. So nowadays, in even in academics, to teach to the students into lab, even during the corona time, the institution have, you know, practiced simulation softwares to train this, you know, engineering students specifically, uh, I mean, how they can perform their practicals into the lab. So they have done it through the simulation softwares only, right? So this simulation is basically a kind of human kind of environment. So uh, majorly it is into educational, you know, education, entertainment, and even in medical as well. Next, 3D printing. Do you know about 3D printing? Anybody knows here? What exactly is the 3D printing? Nowadays, you are doing printing on cup. You are doing printing on pen. Even you are doing printing on keychain, right? And such kind of printing is there, which is giving you the feeling of that you are under the sea. So this is called as the 3D printing. It was not possible earlier. This is only possible through the deep learning and augmenting reality. And in March, you know, 14 2020, Italian hospital save COVID-19 patients by 3D printing values by reanimation devices, okay. I think now everybody knows that how AI is playing important role into hospitality and healthcare industry. If I talk about healthcare industry, so many problems and disease has been diagnosed without doing any operation or any kind of, you know, cuts and stitches with the help of only laser techniques. And how this laser technique work? This laser techniques work on artificial intelligence. So for this, the software has to be developed and this software has to be developed by the, you know, machine learning. Next. Now, what are the advantages and implications of artificial neural network? So I told you that it work as a brain to develop algorithm that can be used to model complex pattern and predictions problem. So whatever the complex, uh, complex pro problems are there that can be predicted with the help of this you know, ANN, we call it as artificial neural network. Let's understand how our brain process information. Can anybody give me an idea? How our brain process information? Anyone here? Huh? Neurons. Neurons plays a very, very important role, of course. But then how is this, uh, I mean, how this information has been processed? Because there are multiple neurons in our brain. Huh? Then how this information has been processed? There are billions of cells, right? There are billions of cells in our brain. We call it as neurons, which process information in the form of electrical signal. Now, which signal has to go at the right direction? That is also a part of you know, in terms of artificial intelligence, it is part of the artificial brains. But then it has to be, uh, I mean, written by the algorithms only, right? Next. So this way, I mean, neural network, just see the diagram, I'll explain you in the next slide. I mean, this is the neural network. There are various, you know, there are synapse and nucleus and how the various exon and neurons work. So all these neurons of the brains are interconnected. So information passes through electrical signal from one nucleus to the you know, dendritis of the next neurons. But then I'll be explaining in the next slide how this process work of the neural network. So our brain is a combination of various neural networks, similarly like of cloud computing. In case of cloud computing, the entire network across the world is spread and it is working through the cloud computing or through this uh, centralized server. Next. So what is the step one? External signal received by the dendrites. Dendrites at the left-hand side, right? And this, in case of external signal process the neuron, cell body and then process signal converted to an output signal and transmitted through the axon. Then output signal received by the dendrites 
of the next neurons through the synapse. So this is the entire process. Though these are very, very technical terms. So those who are not related to this subject, I'm sure they must be finding difficulties to understand this terminology. But then this way, the entire algorithms work. So how this external information is received by the dendrites of the neurons processed in the neuron cell body, converted to an output and passes through exon to the next neuron. So this process goes on and you will keep on receiving the information and based on the information you will work accordingly. So now let's try to understand how this ANN works. If you look at character recognition, have you seen any of the application of image recognition and character recognition? Nowadays there is a barcode, right? Scanner. Everywhere there is a scanner, right? So scanner is what? These are dots. These are dots, right? But a machine is understanding and recognizing the barcode. That is called as a pattern recognition. It is not a character recognition. It is a pa pattern recognition. Similarly, there are barcodes. Okay. Now this machine is understanding this barcode that is all also called as image you know, recognition. So the, how this process works that I am going to tell you. This process is basically working on the basis of artificial intelligence. So artificial is nothing about it work as a human brain but in a more smarter way. So I mean ANN is very playing a very very important role in image processing and character recognition. Even in facial recognition cancer detection nowadays for cancer detection this is working uh, as a you know very very important simulation tools next so the research on ANN now has paved the way for deep neural network that forms the basis of deep learning which has now opened up all exciting and transformation innovation in computer vision speech recognition natural language processing and you know nowadays there are self driving cars car is running by you know own and they are predicting that where the you know uh, what what is the length where uh, there there is a jam right so all this recognition has been done how it is possible have you ever imagined how this is possible this is only possible with the help of artificial intelligence whenever we enter into any of the shopping mall or maybe in hotel the door open by his own this is again an example of artificial intelligence when you enter in a room AC start by his own, right? Or even the fans or lights start by his. That is again a part of artificial intelligence. When you come out of the room, then automatically it, you know, switched off. That is also a part of the artificial. So what exactly the artificial intelligence is? Again and again I'm telling, which is a de human developed algorithms, which has been fitted into the machine, right? And this algorithm has been written into a language, which is called as a machine learning language, okay? In India, now people, not only in India, across the world, people are using, misusing these technologies also. They are making fake videos, you know. Even the Russia and China have also used such fake videos on, you know, social medias to influence the election in the country. You have seen so many riots which is coming on different kind of, you know, fake videos are coming. So, in deep learning, this is only possible through the deep learning. Everybody knows that the entire forecasting is done through the deep learning only. Weather forecasting, you know, storm forecasting, whatever. All the forecasting has to be done through the deep learning also. So deep learning is a part of ANN. Next. Even in artificial, you know, agriculture sector, artificial intelligence is very, very, uh, playing a very important role. When the crop is going to grow in a good manner, or the crop is this year, the crop will not do good. This is only can be predicted through the artificial intelligence. So AI in agriculture is helping farmers to improve their efficiency and reduce the environmental hostile impact so that you can take decision on time and your, you know, uh, this uh, crops can be saved. So the majority of startups in agriculture are adopting AI enabled approach to increase the efficiency of agriculture productions. The market studies reports state that the global AI in agriculture market size is expected to reach 1550 million US dollar. So this is one of the most important emerging stream. So I'm sure as a faculty, as a professor, we must have to tell this to our students that agriculture is coming as one of the prominent sector in coming time. And there are variety of jobs available into this area. But then this is only possible when they have to have 
the learning of technicalities, how these technicalities can improve the agriculture sector. So by 2025, AI, AI will empower you know, the, this industry specifically, which can detect the disease or climate changes sooner and respond smartly. So that is the purpose of AI. So how the climate will change, how you can, you know, how different kind of disease will come and how you can rectify all these measures so that you can save your crops and, you know, give the better yield. Forecasting weather data, monitoring crop, soil health, decrease in pesticide usage by farmer are the important application of AI. If you look at AI agriculture boards, have you ever heard of AI agriculture boards? Boards you all have heard, right? There are so many websites, so many applications where boards are playing very, very important. As in when you open, even nowadays different airlines have their own boards which work as a human, you know, uh, human right. So AI enabled agriculture board help farmer to find more efficient ways to protect their crops from weeds. This is also helping to overcome the labor challenges. AI boards in agriculture field can harvest crop at a higher volume and faster pace than human labor. So wha what is my intention to tell all these things here is so that in your institution you can do more research into this area, you can groom your student, they should come forward to work, how this AI can you know help into different sectors, specifically the sector which is very very important. Agriculture is one of the biggest you know challenge for every every country rather. So how we can do more, better you know agriculture and harvesting that is only possible through AI nowadays. So then it is coming as an emerging sector for employability. AI for industrial application. I think now everybody knows even in mines, coal, different sectors where you know human cannot work efficiently because of various hazards and dangerous you know, uh, implications. So robots are working there. So this is again a part of AI. So all robot implementation has been only possible through the AI. So some of the world largest enterprises have already used AI. You know, there are so many uh, hotels these days, the, I mean, from welcoming to the guest and to drop the guest to the you know, room, these uh, robots are working. So no human, uh, you know, uh, physical human presence is required. So robots are working as a human. So in next five years, Amagens has purchased, you know, $775 million of Kiva to form Amagen Robotics. So Amagen has already produced the robotics. The company has invested heavily in AI techniques to promote shared and open solution to, you know, some of the big problem in unstructured automation. Supply chain service provider announced a five-year, $500 million efforts to develop a technology that will connect shippers and couriers by using real-time data on artificial intelligence to match freight capacity. So that means such a massive, extensive work is going on into this field. So we must you know, look into the aspect that how we can do more and more research and come to a better conclusions. Boeing has, a, Boeing has acquired Liquid Robotics, developer of automation. Maritime system has established a joint analytics. So these are, uh, which, uh, I mean, these are the different kind of, you know, innovation has already been done. German manufacturer Bosch announced a Euro of 300 million investment in the new view of Center for Artificial Intelligence. So that means every big company is coming forward to invest into this industry. That means more and more employment will generate. When more and more employment will generate, so we need to produce the right manpower. So how we will produce the right manpower? When we are we ourselves are trained, right? When we as a faculty and professors are trained, then only we can trade the next generation or the future generation. So this is one of the very, very emerging area. However, various failures and changes are very high. So I'm not only saying the positive, because of higher transition, failure are also very high. So we need to work more on to this you know, research. High level of automation has created a window of opportunity. I told you that there is a lot of automation is happening. So it has created a lot of opportunities also. We are, I mean, all the forward looking companies are coming forward and they're working towards into this competition. Accenture, which is a very big name into IT industry, they have you know, forecasted the industrial internet of things could contribute $10 trillion to the global economy by 2030. So this is a factual data, right? So this data will definitely help you all to work into this area. So this report suggests that sensor material tracking mechanism, 
3D printing, automated product designing, robotic and wearable could help manufacture reduce cost. Nowadays, there are different kind of glasses are also there, which is working on sensing and augmenting reality. So, so when you wear those glasses, you can predict the, you know, uh, ways and you know, your brain will work accordingly. Next. Through uh, IoT, we uh, call it Internet of Things, the network connect, collect, communicate and monitor devices to enhance industrial processes. So when you go into any of the deep you know, industries, you will see that how these robots are functioning and they are doing the productions. So in a way, in a way, this thought must be coming in your mind that employability is reducing by implementing AI. No, it is not the case. One side we are saying employability is reducing, at the other side I am saying that the skill based labor is required. When we are saying skill based labor is required, that means whatever these new technicalities are coming, be it blockchain or AI or even deep learning or even robotics or even robotic process automation, big data, IIoT. So these technicalities we have to learn as a faculty so that we can train to our student. These technicalities are not to be learned by only technical people, right? This has to be learned by all the professors because I've given all the examples, even in healthcare, agriculture, engineering, automation, automobile, everywhere we are using all these technicalities. Siemens has already, Siemens is a very big company, it's a German company. They have offered a software called MindSphere. Their software is a cloud-based operating system which enables machine and equipment inside a plant to collect the data. They have various plants, right? And these machines are collecting the data from the machine instead of physical human presence. Robots are collecting the data. Robots are collating the data. And robots are coming for the final conclusion of result of the data. So where the human intervention is? So human intervention is to write the algorithm. Human intervention is to create the machine learning softwares. So that is the job of the skilled manpower nowadays. So that means this is a very, very big challenge. And of course, a big threat to the academic community as well, that we have to change ourselves. We need to be, you, we need to train ourselves. We need to change based on the industry perspective, what industry is demanding. And as per the need of the industry demand, we have to prepare ourselves and we need to prepare the future generation as well. For example, production in a battery factory running on mine software spear platform, which is by the Siemens, they are producing 1 lakh batteries in a day. But sensor data might inform analytics that shows that production has dipped in the past two days. So if the production has reduced in two day, last two days, what is the reason? why the production has reduced, what could be the reason. So these reason has to be find out by the sensory data, uh, you know, machines. We call it as the robotics. So this software is called as MindSphere, which has been developed by the Siemens. Next. Siemens have, clo uh, you know, claims they have helped Heathrow Airport, which is in UK, that their airport improved their baggage handling system with sensor and MindSphere. Nowadays, when you go to international airport, you see that entire automation, you know, system is working. So this automation is purely based on the machines, I mean, on the artificial intelligence. So again, the conclusion is that you need the skilled manpower. So when we are seeing skilled manpower, so we need to generate the skilled resources. When we are generating skilled resources, that means we as a researcher have to do more and more research so that we can, you know, do more and more innovation into this area. So IBM Watson, General Electric and Rethink Robotics has already been there. IBM is already working very extensively into this area. Next, AI and mining. So I already claim that IBM have helped Gold Corp increase the productivity. IBM has a software called IBM Watson. So the IBM Watson is helping the mining companies to conduct the analytics, which can reduce drilling cost, improve predictions, and mineral exploration. So the usage of this software is not only, you know, helping the mankind, it also reducing the cost of the production. It is also reducing the cost of the, you know, entire manufacturing processes. 
So when the cost is uh, you know, uh, uh, reducing, so that means somewhere or the other way, we are you know, contributing to the economy as well, right? Because you are you know, spending less on you know, production cost and the raw material cost. Next. IBM also lists Sandvik and Wellenjo coal mines as some of the mining clients. IBM has helped Geological Survey of India to discover gold mines in you know, Sonbhadra, Uttar Pradesh, India. You know, in India, recently you have heard that there is a gold mine has been, you know, found. So this gold mine is the, you know, uh, the outcome of IBM software. We call it as a geological survey, which has been developed by IBM. So this software has biggest power nowadays. Now, what exactly, uh, you know, AI is playing the role into education industry? Since we all are academicians here, we were more interested to know that how this AI is helping to the education industry. This academic world is becoming more convenient and personalized nowadays. Corona have really realized that we can work into hybrid environment. Even we can learn the entire, we can run the entire college and institution in a virtual environment. So definitely this, uh, the thanks to the numerous application of AI for education. During this time of pandemic, your institution had never shut for even a day. You were immediately ready when this you know, pandemic has been declared. Maybe in three, four days, you were fully equipped. So this is the beauty of the academician that we are the fast learners. But at the same time, there were numerous softwares already available in the industry, and we have utilized those software to do the learning. So uh, simulation labs, cognitive lab, you know, brain sphere labs, and even the robotics lab, automation lab, imagine our, uh, you know, AWS lab. This lab has been implemented during the time of the corona, and I'm sure. Uh, companies are coming forward these days, right? Why these tech companies are coming forward? Because they have realized the importance of these kind of technologies into education. So today, students don't need to attend physical classes to study. They have computers and internet connection. If they have computer and internet connection, their college is open all the time. So AI is also allowing the automation of administrative tasks, allowing institutions to minimize the time required to complete difficult tasks so that educator can spend more time with the student and educator can spend more time with the research as well. AI in healthcare, I told you, AI has been developed and applied to practice to diagnose the you know, problems, to, treatment, to do the treatment protocol development, drug development and personalized medicines and patient monitoring and cares. I know there are so many big hospitals in India. They are, uh, I mean, best of the best doctors are available. Even then, these doctors are, you know, taking the help of all these machines. Whenever you go into any of the operation theater, you see, uh, I mean, uh, all these machines are working on to, you know, automations, right? For any of the problem detection. So various, uh, you know, specialties in medicine have shown an increase in research regarding AI, such as radiology. Radiology is now I mean, the entire scanning is done, MRI, different kind of scannings are there, right? So these scannings are again a part of image processing, which is again a application of AI. Disease diagnose, AI, if you talk about in healthcare, you can see the entire, you know, the entire system of the internal organs with the help of these machines. This is only possible through AI. So AI in healthcare is playing a very, very important vital role these days. Can you do a little faster? Yeah. AI in electrical engineering, because I'm sure you all are, in, you know, in, mostly there are engineering people. So AI in electrical engineering as a high tension power supplies, transmission lines can be the solution to incompetence in finding faults other than microscopic level. So if there is a big machine, you know, lines of machine, finding a fault is not an easy task. So this is also possible through AI that AI can detect the fault findings through this, you know, automated softwares. Next. This is basically motion and manipulations. So how this, the entire, you know, uh, the staircase works based on the, you know, softwares. This is again emotion and manipulations. Intelligence is required for robots to be able to handle such tasks because robots is again a man-made machine. So how this man-made machine will work, that is again a part of the intelligence. So AI research, including Lisp and Prolog, which is again an algorithm-based languages, which languages are, you know, helping this automation industry to do more and more AI-based researches. Next. This, these are some of the examples that how these, you know, softwares, nowadays drones are there, right? The entire moon satellites and functioning is being monitored through the drones and robotics. 
So AI is playing a very, very important role in outer space research and aerospace engineering. So this is one of the glorified example of you know, application of AI. And AI has reached to the moons and Mars of the other planets. And how this is possible? This is only possible through AI. So I think we have discussed a lot about AI, that how this AI you know, helping the entire industry, specifically the healthcare, you know, nanoscience, aerospace, education, healthcare, agriculture. So I think there is a more need to do research into this area because very less research has been done into this area. But then, but then there is a strong need, right? That we should come forward and do more and more research. At least an empirical study can be done. This is my the entire submission for this session today. All the best to all the participants here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for sharing your keynote speech. Thank you, Madam and Sir, for your inspiring perspective on this highly significant occasion. I would now like to request a Dr. Manju Gupta to please present a memento and certificate to our special guest, Dr. P. Valiangiri. Following with, I would now like to invite Dr. P. Valiangiri to please present a memento and certificate to our keynote speaker, Dr. Manju Gupta. Uh, please stay. Uh, facilitating with now, I would like to again invite uh, Dr. P. Valiangirisa and Dr. Manju Gupta to present a memento and certificate to our keynote speaker, Dr. Shada Purohit. Thank you, sir, ma'am. I kindly request everyone uh, to gather for, uh, forward for a group picture along with our special guests and keynote speakers, please.
Hello everyone. Kindly turn on your cameras for group photo. Thank you, everyone. What on the Thanks for turning your camera.
you everyone for joining us back. And now I would like to invite our keynote speaker, Dr. Ipsita Nanda, Dean, Faculty of Information Technology at Gopal Narayan Singh University, Jamuhar Rotas, Bihar, India. Dr. Ipsita Nanda did her doctorate from CAPGS, Baiju Patnik University of Technology, Road Lake, Odisha, India. Her area of speech is system on chips design, internet of things, artificial intelligence, machine learning, automation design, data science, etc. She has published many indexed papers in journals mm -hmm. and in international conferences. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ipsita Nanda completed her MTech from Kalinga mm -hmm. Institute. May we please have Dr. Ipsita Nanda to kindly address the gathering, please? Hello everyone, uh, I'm Dr. Ipsita Nanda. I'm not able to share my screen. Uh, can you please? Uh... I need some permission, I think. Yeah, thank you. Is it visible? Hope it's visible. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank yes, you so much. Visible. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, uh, my topic is the strategy of IoT and AI. As I heard many speakers, so IoT is no more a new topic for anybody these days. So it's a common now, and uh, many researchers are still working on uh, this topic as this is also known as green computing iot 
So in this, we can say that uh, these days we consider IoT as IO, IOE, IOE, that is I, Internet of Everything and uh, Internet of Anything. So these two terms are also uh, used because over here we utilize some unique identifiers and uh, which is very much capable to connect human to human and human to robots, human to machine. So uh, these days we say that it's like uh, it works on many sensors like the things which is connected uh, through the applicable network and we can uh, say it is connected to the automation design and in a natural way with some IP addresses and in a manner the things are connected. So a sensor network of billions of smart devices that connect people and other applications to collect and share data. So transmission reception of the data is the common thing which is utilized uh, with the help of sensors and which is connected with the internet with the things. So this is a topic which consists of on of switch or we can say that if it digi uh, digitization that is zero and one and through which is like the transmission and reception of data goes on with the giant network which is connected with all the things. So it's relationship between the people, 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 things, and many things we can see. So IoT, IoT is connected with many industry, many organization. That means we are giving importance to the implementation. We are giving uh, importance to the customers to deliver and enhance different services. Like the decision making which is going on is depends on the researchers, the academia, those who are working on this, and they uh, do market survey and do some analysis work so that they can uh, deliver whatever the market demands. So academia, we can uh, say that why academia? Because we have to do a lot of study. And then why research? Because we need to do some implementation work. And then with the capability, we have to increase the product uh, to the business. So implementation is very, very re requirement and for which we require the strategy, the plan, which we have to build with the study of market. So as we can see over here, this is IoT AI ecosystem. Now what is IoT AI ecosystem, which is connected with a web enabled smart devices, which is connected with embedded processes, which is connected with sensors, and communication hardware to software to send the data to the environment. So as a whole, we can say whatever we are doing is known as computation. And uh, for computation, we require some storage that is uh, which is connected with the cloud. So there are train strategies, which is very, very important, which uh, we consider as a researcher, as an academician, as an administration or as we are connected to these days with the startups companies so for which we implement all this 10 strategy uh, i have considered 10 top strategies we can consider more than that so here uh, artificial intelligence social legal and ethical iot informatics and data broking in the first slide that is data is a field which is very much required for the connectivity for the connectivity of the organization to derive from it we define the long-term success. Social and legal, uh, ethical IoT, because these just many uh, data are available, which should be socially, ethically connected, and there should be some uh, legal problems. So there should be some rules and regulation, which will be giving us the permission to access the data. Otherwise, there will be some security problems. So Informix and data broking, the, in this case, we say that the theory of Infonix uh, takes monetization of data further by saying the business, as I said, that everything should be related with uh, business analysis because we have to launch the product in the market. So business prospects is very much important. So fourth one, the shift from intelligence edge to intelligence mess because edge computing and mess computing are both connected 
and mesh network is utilized for the transmission of data so as as a whole we can say that mesh like uh, for example we can take home automation design which recently a project i have completed on this that is uh, uh, as a whole uh, implementation as i said so home automation design which uh, which is connected with the mesh network with the wifi enabled uh, so that that project that is small project which is completed uh, which we, uh, you can say that as a designer as a architecture designer so it the implementation done iot governance like uh, we can say that as the iot continues to expand the need of the governance framework ensures appropriate behavior in the creation storage proper everything should be properly installed properly connected so uh, as a um, whole i can say that uh, the information related to iot project will become increasingly important because uh, by 2023 or uh, as uh, by 2025 we can say that all the things will be implemented and uh, all the projects which we are doing in a small scale will be implemented in a large scale in the uh, business industry sensors innovation in this uh, enable wide range of situation which is detected and uh, seriously it is connected to the sensor market and it will be continuously through 2023 because as i uh, saw that by 2025 everything will be automized trusted hardware and operating system because uh, if the coding is done in the software uh, it should be implemented in the hardware so that it will be tested and it will be implemented and then it will be launched in the market with a secure iot system eight one we can say that this novel iot user experience as a new algorithm new sensors new architecture everything is socially connected so as a whole uh, there should be some novelty and uh, like patented designs and all so that uh, we can experience some connections chief uh, silicon chief innovation as i am a chief designer i am working on an automation design recently and on that project i am like trying to uh, uh, low power like i have uh, i'm trying to reduce the power consumption uh, which is connected with many iot sensors and um, i think it will be successful uh, by uh, next 1 to 2 years so new wireless uh, networking technology for iot because in partial explored like 5g the forthcoming generation of the low earth orbit state scattered like uh, many it will be connected with many network so these are the 10 which is uh, which i have given importance because all are inter uh you can say mutually connected or interconnected or multi connected so these are the terms which is utilized for the connectivity for the networking purpose because for iot ai machine learning everything connectivity is most really required so as i said that uh, iot means ioe that is everything should be connected and anything can be connected with that so iot offers a number of benefits to the organism uh, organization enabling monitor improve save enhance integrate better and generate like what is the monitor what it will monitor as i said that business analysis business processes should be monitored so that the experiment which is uh, done in the small scale can be taken to the large scale so everything should be analyzed the improvement in the customer experiences because we can say that the connectivity the networking connectivity is very much important so the customers should enjoy whatever we are doing as a research save time and money because uh, money is time and time is money everybody knows that enhance employee productivity integrate and adapt business model so that uh, as uh, time and money is related so we have to go to the business model which will be successful so better uh, make better business decisions and generate more revenues because without revenue we can't progress so these are the small iot applications consumer and enterpre- enterprise those who are related to this so in the future the smart world of the future that is iot and ai will be connected with air pollution see these are the sensors many sensors are there 
which will be connected and air pollution forest fire detection wine quality enhancing offspring care sportsman care uh, then structural health so many so water quality then smartphone detection so electromagnetic labels all this checking will be done with the help of our sensors so all these things will be coming these are the we can say these are the green research areas which anybody can work on so sample uh, iot product services that is uh, like we can say helmet uh, consists helmet uh, cuson sensor medical alert uh, watch so these are let me show you few this helmet sensor so this is already launch, launched and many are getting the benefit amazon dash which is like you uh, you will just click the button and you will be just uh, taking the advantage of the technology kinsa thermometer is one of the example then then automation design of a car so automation design we can check the pressure we can monitor the pressure of the wheel we can uh, get uh, this uh, signal uh, from the car that uh, your tire is having less pressure so to avoid so smart farming use of iot ai to improve agriculture so in case of agri tech because this is very green topic agri tech agri tech means uh, not only connected with light humidity temperature uh, soil moisture we can say uh, we can also do soil uh, analysis also like uh, nitrogen phosphorus everything everything can be analyzed with the help of iot agriculture so drones are also made for which uh, the Indian government or uh, any grants are available, multiple grants are available for agri-tech in, uh, industry. So in that case, we can take our agriculture into one of the prospects, agricultural drones, precision farming, livestock monitoring, and smart greenhouses. So if all this uh, we can consider, these days priority is given to the agriculture drones, through which we can uh, take the advantage of the payloads to for uh, distribution of the pesticides, for the distributions of the medicines for the plants. So many things, many things are there. We can also do the analysis for the better optimization techniques we can take for the calculation of the water uses and for which we can do some analysis work for the treatment also. For which many uh, consultancies are there, which adapt the technology and accordingly they start. So IIoT, a connected factory leads to the smart factory. So industry, if it is not connected to the real world, then it's not uh, it's not of use. So the physical system are made the intelligent use of IoT, the real time communication and cooperation both with each other and with human is established by the wireless web. So in, if it is connected with the manufacturing world, so there should be digitally connected factory, facility management should be there, production flow monitoring, inventory management, then we can say plant safety and security, which is very much required, quality control, that is IoT sensors collect aggregate product data and other third party syndicated data, from various stages of a product cycle. Packaging optimization, then logistic and supply chain optimization. So these two are already connected to the market world. So as industry, so packaging is must and logistic and supply management optimization is there. IoT also bears with many challenges like security of the data, reliability and stability, which is connected with the IIoT sensors. Connectivity of all the systems in IIT setup, uh, where uh, no, um, no maintenance can be done. Blending legacy systems, that is IIoT is a new to the market. It will take some time that people will understand what is IIoT and accordingly they will come up. So uh, what needs to be done, that is the cons uh, consumer education, so that we can sensitize the consumer 
products review and comparison before launching it we should compare it uh, with the other products self certification and voluntary course of the practice then trust mark government initiative uh, like many government these days initiated with agri tech fintech uh, that is uh, auto automation design so they have taken already initiative but they have to understand what is the logic behind it mandatory security requirements mandatory certification liability reforms all these are required to be done before doing or before going to a big market or larger scale the, the future of iot is bright and uh, uh, you can see many analysis work is done and uh, many plannings are also going on for the last scale products uh, for especially we can see this is iot is considered in many ai implementation with many ai implementation in automation design in a larger scale that is new cars uh, which is launched so these are the references so thank you for hearing me so patiently and if anybody is interested to work with me in any project please contact me and this is my email id and i will be available so thank you so much thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity for the key talk and this is hope uh, we will work further Thank you. Thank you so much. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. published by Mangalam Publisher, awarded from Uttar Pradesh Higher Education Department and Charan, Mr. Charan Singh University for excellence in the field of education. Her area of expertise is advertising and public relations. She has experience in teaching a wide range of subjects that includes advertising, public relations and corporate communications, development communications, media research, media theories, brand management, and integrated marketing communications, both at bachelor's and master's level. I welcome you, ma'am. Thank you so much. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, she has already explained uh, my uh, brief bio, but still I want to uh, say something about me. I have, uh, uh, you know, uh, my area of expertise is advertising and public relation. I have uh, done PhD in mass communication. So I guess since morning we all are uh, listening the engineering and, uh, you know, IT field uh, uh, topics. So today I am going to uh, discuss about the, uh, you know, topic related to social sciences. And I hope uh, there are uh, some few people who must be there for uh, social sciences stream, right? Uh, so how many of uh, you are from this field? You both, I guess. Yeah, okay, okay, that's great, that's great. I thought everyone, uh, everyone is, uh, you know, from engineering field. So today, uh, I hope uh, my PPT is there. Yeah.
So since I'm, uh, I belong to a journalism and mass communication field, but uh, my uh, topic is uh, civil society organization and Indian polity and governance. So basically, why uh, uh, civil society uh, require, and what exactly is the civil society? So I, I would like to uh, explain you uh, why it is required and how it can help uh, to form a very good govern government, right? So I will explain this right now. Can you please change the slide? Next. So the term, uh, yeah, uh, the earlier one. So first of all, you need to understand what is civil society, okay? So the term civil society is used to collectively refer to the voluntary organization. You must be aware about uh, the NGOs, non-government organization or non-profit organizations. There are uh, many organizations who are actually working in the area of uh, society to develop the country all over the world, I guess. So in India also, there are many NGOs, many non-profit organizations who are actually working for the uh, development of the society. Right? So these are the civil society who actually work for the society uh, or at the society level. Social active groups, that these could be a social active groups, firms working for the development of the society. So civil society is a set of intermediates, association which is neither the state nor the family, but which plays an active and positive role in social, economic and cultural activities. Okay, so all around the development of the country, civil societies are required. So, uh, next slide, please. Now, let's discuss why it is required. Why civil society is required. I think everybody, you know, knows how these, these NGOs are working for the society, okay? So, uh, uh, maybe uh, if you want a uh, uh, government should, uh, you know, uh, work properly, then we should, you know, uh, these civil societies are there to, you know, uh, uh, pr propose the voice of the uh, audience to the government, okay? So, civil society as an instrument for securing right and interest of the people. It is very much required, okay? So, civil society works for the discharging several economic, social, cultural, moral and other responsibilities which falls in the domain of private activities, okay? It is not uh, done by the government, it is done by the private organization. It, is, uh, it, ca it could be your, you know, at, at the society level, it could be your, um, you know, um, uh, family level, or it could be any group uh, which actually actively work for the development of the society. It is not a part of government, yet it serves the purpose of securing the rights, general welfare, development of all the people of the state. Next slide, please. So, uh, the second, mo early one. Yeah, so the second most important factor is growing strength and role of civil society. So, civil society has been becoming more and more aware, alert and active. Okay, nowadays, people are more active. They are, you know, uh, active in terms of their comment. They know what are their rights. Because maybe because of social media, maybe because of communication, maybe because of mass communication, now we all are aware what are our rights and uh, you know how we can you know uh, uh, communicate with the government directly or indirectly. So these are the active uh, societies who actually work for the government or who actually work for the people and uh, you know uh, uh, raise the voice of the people. Okay. So, continuous presence and successful working of Indian liberal democratic political system, the spread of literacy, the freedom of mass media, the existence of very broad-based decentralized local self-government system, the presence of direct homogeneous and democratic process of political socialization, and people's full commitment to liber liberal democracy have been together helping the society to become increasingly actively active and strong. Next slide, please. Next. So, why it is important? Important for the society only, okay? It is important to empower the society, to inform the society, to engage the citizen of the country, okay? Uh, it, it, it actually motivates people to raise their voice, to actively participate, to actively participate in the society, okay? So, uh, so it create a positive environment for the society basically. It is very important 
to uh, uh, for the uh, you know uh, if you want a government should work properly then these societies are there for the uh, people uh, they, they actually raise the voice of the people now <clears throat> if i talk about the uh, there are five point agenda for supporting these civil societies okay so first point is build awareness and हेलो हेलो चले स्टार्ट ओके 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 सो शेल आई स्टार्ट ना ओके सो वी वर डिस्कसिंग अबाउट द बिल्ड लॉन्ग टर्म्स कोलैबोरेटिव पार्टनरशिप ओके so with the help of this uh, conference also we are you know uh, definitely going to uh, build a long term partnership definitely we are going to meet some uh, maybe in some other country or you know we can invite you uh, in india for some other lectures or some you know collaboration so that we can also collaborate you know you can share your uh, uh, you know knowledge and we can also share our knowledge right so this is also a kind of society which you know uh, we are collaborating for the development of the de maybe uh, development for ourselves or development of, for the country because we are doing research mm -hmm. and uh, with the help of research definitely a country will grow right so uh, the th next point is supporting dy dynamic accountability so, uh, so civil society organization should be primarily accountable um towards the people they are trying to serve and represent okay so donors or any other institution should only come second the focus is on the citizen of the uh, so, uh, country what democracy should be about okay so civil society organization according to world bank 
includes a diverse range of organization including community groups non government organizations labor unions indigenous groups philanthropic organization etc okay so why this um, why we need a civil society so uh, citizen have right to check their representative work if we want to check whether our government is working uh, uh, properly or not definitely civil society are there to you know raise the voice to bring attention to the such acts as civil liberties violation or government's failures to provide citizen with the acceptable started uh, standard of living so as a part of right of, to freedom of expression article 19 of the constitution guaranteed the democratic right to uh speech okay so india in india there is a article for called 19a so we have uh, you know freedom of speech so whatever we want as a citizen of india or maybe there are many countries who uh, citizen of their country you know they have equal right to speech or equal right to express themselves so democracy uh, become uh, so uh, now we uh, discuss ki what is the role of cso cso is uh, civil society okay organizations the government has so first role is the government has left various loopholes in the de development process in a huge developing country like india in modern india civil society is attempting to fill the gap okay adding to the government endeavor to offer health care to citi citizen and boosting policy public awareness about issues such as child and maternal malnutrition civil society and media works together to educate individual about the danger of corruptions raise their awareness and secure their participation by, uh, by providing them a voice by serving uh, on community and submitting memorandum Well, civil society can have an impact on the policies which government actually making so there are n number of you know work which civil society can uh, you know do for the development of the country and can help also uh, help the government to you know change uh, their policies and their plans okay so as of now uh, this is uh, uh, what i wanted to speak i hope uh, later on we can you know collaborate Uh, with each other so thank you so much it was a very uh, good session and i'm i'm enjoying the session and i'm you know really uh, having good time with you all thank you so much thank you ma'am for sharing your keynote speech i now welcome our guest speaker dr delshi hoselia devi r professor in department of ai and data science at karpaga vinayaga college of engineering and technology chinna kolambakkam chengalpettu district tamil nadu india professor dr delshi hauselia devi received her be distinction in computer science and engineering from the madurai kamraj university in 2004 ME in computer science and engineering from Anna University Chennai in 2008 and PhD in information and in information and communication engineering from Anna University Chennai in 2018 she is a professor and head at the department of artificial intelligence and data science at Karpaga Vinayaga College of Engineering and Technology Tamil Nadu she has 16 years of teaching experience and has approximately 30 conference publications and 23 international journal publications she has published 18 national patents and one international patent she received a research project proposal which was assigned from sapienza university rome i now welcome ma'am to kindly share a few words to the audience thank you
Am I audible? Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning to everyone present here. Uh, myself, Dr. Delcy Kaushalya Devi. I'm the professor and head in the Department of Artificial Intelligence and Data Science in Karpavanaiga College of Engineering and Technology. First of all, I would like to thank IFPRB uh, for organizing this type of event uh, because the students are uh, very much get benefited by, through this uh, conference. And, uh, and I also would like to thank, uh, invite me uh, for this session. Right. Uh, in this session, uh, I just want to convey a few words about uh, career path to the students. Uh, in our college, that is uh, our college, Karpavanaiga College of Engineering and Technology, we are following the system uh, for uh, developing the student career, uh, like a career path. As I, you all aware of that, uh, what is the career path? Uh, what we are exactly uh, following this career path in the sense. Uh, the all the most of the student doesn't aware about what they will become, right? Uh, I mean, uh, what they are going to become, so either software engineer, either entrepreneur, or a, or either they are going to higher studies. At the end of final semester only, that is in the final year only, uh, they will uh, get chance to uh, what chance to uh, that is what uh, they are going to become. So we are we are insisting the students from the first semester insert itself, uh, like we are giving the uh, job role. For example, uh, for example, our students, A and B students, they don't have idea because it's a, it's a very new field. Uh, they don't have about aware about what are the type of job roles available in this field. So we are insisting the students, what are the job roles available uh, for A students and data scientist right like uh, for example data engineer they are, are uh, architect and a lot of job opportunities is there for uh, specific this domain to studying students so we are giving the input to the students what are the type of job roles available and we are asking the students to select any one type of job for example some one of the students is taking the uh, job role is data scientist Right. Uh, from the first semester in itself, we are giving the input to the particular students, those who selected the data scientists, uh, what type of uh, uh, technical courses they, are, they have to study and what type of uh, soft skill uh, training they have to do for becoming the data scientist. Right. Then second semester and the up to the seventh, up to eighth semester, we are giving the uh, in, in instructions to this particular student uh, for developing their career. Through this system, why I am sharing uh, this career path system uh, to this forum means it may be benefit to the any student and the faculty members also. You can also follow the system uh, through career path. We can uh, fix the student career because most of the students, we, we know that as a faculty members, we know that most of the students doesn't aware and doesn't know what they will become and what uh, their career will. So if, because of this, at, at the final uh, semester, they will face a lot of issues. So either they are going for uh, entrepreneur and either they are going for higher studies. So if we, if we are following this type of system means, Definitely, students will fix uh, the one career, and they are uh, they are working and they are studying towards that career, right? So our college is uh, following this system, and we are getting the uh, good uh, output uh, through this system, right? And one more thing, uh, I'm finding uh, this agenda. There are lot of uh, ideas, to students, lot of presentation is I'm I'm finding. Uh, I'm, I'm asking this to, I'm just conveying the students and faculty members if you are interested to publish the same ideas into the patents because I'm, uh, I'm uh, doing the patent uh, processing also. Uh, I know uh, very well about how we can make the uh, documentation because, uh, because most of the faculties and most of the students interested to do in the <coughs> 
do uh, in patent but they uh, don't have idea how to make the document just they are paying the money to the consultancy and they are uh, they are doing that their patent this is not a right way if anybody interested please uh, contact me uh, for uh, doing your uh, for developing your ideas with the patent uh, my i will uh, give my mail id uh, into the chat box uh, we can uh, develop your ideas into the patent publication and patent grant also it's a very most of them think like uh, patent is the very uh, uh, much very much uh, that is uh, it's a uh, it's a one good product only we can develop the product they are thinking like uh, it's a very uh, grand process so how we can proceed this patent they, they will think like uh, it's not like uh, for getting the grant is very simple process uh, one thing you will think if your idea is having the novelty because every idea we can publish into the patent but getting the grant is difficult because you are novel if you are idea is having the novelty i i found the many ideas it's a good ideas in the paper paper uh, in the agenda so that's why i'm sharing this uh, uh, to this uh, session uh, anyway uh, thanks to if or uh, erp for inviting me to this session uh, thank you and Thank you so much, ma'am, for sharing your speech. And now, moving forward to an exclusive event, I'd now like to invite our special guest speaker, Dr. Santosh B. Rani, Dean of Academics at Sardar Patel College of Engineering in Mumbai, India. Dr. Santosh Rani is currently working in Sardar Patel College of Engineering, Mumbai. He worked as a Dean Academics in SP. CE Mumbai 2019 to 2022 he is an associate director of maharashtra state at fela federation of educational leaders and administrators dr santosh rani is a master black belt in lean six sigma from indian statistical institute he has more than 115 publications and more than 1545 Google Scholar citations on his credit. He has also filed 14 patents, filed 9 patents, granted 6 patents. He has successfully guided 5 PhD scholars and 30 MTech scholars. He is recipient of 13 awards which includes National Fellowship Award IIIE, SAE Indian Foundation National Level Campaign Award National Productivity Award Platinum Grade Best Paper Awards He received certification of recognition from the Academic Council of ULEX as one of the top 20 eminent deans in India for the year 2020 I now request Dr Santosh Rani to kindly address the audience and share a few words please I would once again like to invite uh, Dr. 
uh, I'm sorry, I would once again like to invite our special guest speaker, Dr. Santosh Birani, Dean of Academics at Sardar Patel College of Engineering in Mumbai, India, to kindly address the audience, please. I'm sorry for the delay. Uh, Dr. Santosh Rane will be joining us after 15 minutes. We now proceed with uh, technical session one for today. Madam, I joined. Oh, I'm so sorry, sir. <laughs> I would like to welcome you, sir. Could you please share a few words? Thank you, madam. Let me share my screen. Whether my screen is getting shared? Uh, Mr. Karthik, sir, could you please play the screen? Madam, will you please help me in sharing the screen? Please allow me to share the screen. Yes, sir, we are just checking up on it. Is it visible? Yes, sir, it's visible. Shall I start? Yes, sir, you may please begin. Thank you, madam. Good morning to all of you, and sorry for the technical glitches. Today, we are interested to uh, have a brief idea regarding the digital twin engineering. My presentation outline will cover the definition, concepts, digital twin in the business, digital twin in automotive value chain, digital twin in supply chain, digital twin in manufacturing. We will also cover digital twin in healthcare, then types of the digital twin technology, softwares, enablers, and limitations. Then we will also check the market scenario. I have beautiful case studies of the digital twin 
in manufacturing and the digital twin in the farm produce. So let us start with the basics, the digital twin. These are the two words where there is a physical object and there is a digital replica. And we need to establish the two-way communication between the physical object and the digital replica. The objective of designing, developing the digital twin is to, is to create the system which can respond and which can be controlled to the unexpected input variables. So digital twin are the outcome of the continuous improvement in the creation of the products, design and engineering activities. Product drawings and engineering specifications progress from handmade drafting to computer aided drafting, computer aided design to model based system engineering. For digital twin engineering, we need to start with engineering graphics, solid modeling, then giving the boundary conditions. Based on that, carrying out the necessary simulations and then establishing the two-way communication between the physical object and the digital replica. The digital twin of the physical object is dependent on the digital thread. There is a difference between the digital twin and the digital thread. Digital thread is the lowest level of the design and the specification of the digital twin. So this is prepared for the smallest component. And when <clears throat> we want to establish this digital thread, particularly digital thread and the digital twin, we need to install the smart sensors at the right location with the appropriate XYZ orientations, with the appropriate R theta gamma orientations, with the highest level of precision to capture almost all the different, different parameters in the systems. The changes to the product design are implemented using engineering change orders. An ECO made to component item will result in a new version of items, digital thread and correspondingly to the digital twin. So this digital twin technology is one of the topmost technologies declared by Gartner in 2017. It is one among the top 10 strategic technologies. So digital twin concept represents the convergence of physical and the virtual world where every industrial product will get a dynamic digital representation. So throughout the product development life cycle, right from the design phase to the deployment phase, organizations can have complete digital footprint of their products. These connected digital things generate data in real time and this helps businesses in better analyze and predict the problems in advance or give early warning, prevent downtime, develop new opportunities and even plan better products for the future at lower cost by using simulations. So simulation play a very important role in exploring the optimum performance of our physical product. It may be a machine, it may be the entire plant, it may be the entire organization, it may be the entire city. We can create the digital twin of the city. All these will have a greater impact on delivering a better customer experience in business as well. So digital twins, which incorporates big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, IoT, augmented reality, virtual reality. So blockchain, all these technologies, which are the part of industry 4.0 basket are going to be used in the digital twin for establishing the two-way communication for getting the optimal business results. So digital twin is a comprehensive physical and functional description of the component product or system, which includes more or less all information 
which could be useful in all the current and subsequent life cycle phases. Digital twin is a multi-physical, multi-scale probabilistic simulation model of complex product. It uses updated sensors and physical models to mirror physical life in the digital world and vice versa. So here, the smart sensors will play a most important role to capture almost all kind of a data from the system. The effortless integration of the data between the physical and the virtual machine in either, that is also the digital twin. So these digital twins are the computational representations of both living and non-living objects and processes. They can be used to describe, analyze, and simulate current and future states of and interventions in these objects. Now we will move towards the projections of the digital twin in coming years. This projection has been given by American Society of Mechanical Engineers. It says that up to 89% of all IoT platforms will include digital twins by 2025. The digital twinning will be a standard IoT feature by 2027. Nearly 36% of the executives across variety of industries understand the benefits of the digital twinning with about half of them planning to use it in their operations by 2028. So why the digital twin become more important? The basic reason is the user's experience and the optimal conditions to the unpredicted, unexpected field conditions. That is the optimal performance, even for the unpredicted field conditions. And for that purpose, the digital twin will play a very important role. So how do these digital twin work? These digital twins, the virtual counterparts of the physical assets are created as the digitalized duplicates of machines, equipments, or physical sites using sensors. So these digital assets can be created even before these assets are built. So to create a digital twin of any physical asset, we need to collect and synthesize the data from various sources including the physical data, manufacturing data, supply chain data, operational data, and all the insights from the analytics software. All this information along with artificial intelligence algorithm, machine learning algorithm, those are integrated into a physics-based virtual model. By applying analytics into these models, we get relevant insights, more information regarding the physical asset. So the consistent flow of this data helps in getting the best possible analysis and insights regarding the assets, which help in optimizing the business outcome. Thus, the digital twin will act as a live model of physical equipment. Now, let me give you a brief idea regarding how the real product and the digital representation, they communicate with each other and how do we go for designing and development of the digital twin for the manufacturing case. So we start collecting the data from the real product, particularly you can consider it as a physical asset. It may be a machine in the manufacturing. This data is then saved at the local level. Then it is transferred to the IoT, <clears throat> but it is transferred through IoT gateway to the cloud. Then it is evaluated and analyzed. Further, he, the input variables, input conditions are varied. There is, and based on that, the simulation is carried out. We evaluate the simulations and finally save the results. Then we transfer these parameters, make the necessary arrangement in the real product so that the real product gives the optimal performance for the variable input conditions. So let us take an example for a vessel, a ship in sea. So what are the different systems needed for that? So a digital twin is a virtual representation of an asset used from early design through building and operation, maintained and easily accessible throughout its life cycle. 
So what kind of different systems are available? Analytical models for structures and hydrodynamics, information model for systems and components, 3D visualization models of components and structures, time domain models of components and systems, sensors and process data from the real vessels, software-driven control algorithms, virtualized communication networks. These are some of the systems which are necessary for designing and development of the digital twin for the ship. Now, what can be the different technologies used for digital twinning of the vessel, the ship? So here, initially, we need to create a virtual product. For that purpose, we need the we need to uh, <clears throat> use the CAD software. We need to prepare the three D model. Then we have we need to analyze, integrate, and visualize the data using the data analytics, data integration, data visualization, artificial intelligence. Then we need to simulate the behavior of the ship using the various simulation softwares like Simulink, Console, and many more. And we can take the help of the technologies like augmented reality and the virtual realities. Then we need to communicate with the virtual product using the IoT, then establishing the necessary connectivity. This will also help us for storing the data and then analyzing the data using the cl cloud computing. Fine. So digital twin in business will leverage the <clears throat> business operations, particularly here, a brief idea is given. Let us take an example about the real world business operation. This is the existing business condition at the left hand side and at the right hand side, there is a digital world. And this um, particular business um, uh, experience a cyclone, hurricane. Now, this physical uh, plant is expected to be shut down in normal conditions. When we have the digital world, particularly digital twin, then this digital twin will explore what if scenarios, what if the plant one shut down? And based on that, it will create a contingency plan for a plant shutdown. And based on that, implement the contingency plan. And we will get the optimal performance of our system with the best business deliverables. Now for a particular automotive product life cycle, the digital twin has many things to take into considerations for the product concept, product design, manufacturing planning, manufacturing execution, product sales, product usage and maintenance and product renewal. There are the different, different <coughs> knowledge areas which we need to encompass while designing and developing the digital twin. I will skip some of the slides because uh, here we have a limited uh, time and we need to cover some of the essentials. Now, digital twin in supply chain management, particularly visibility is at most essential component of any business, particularly in supply chain, visibility play a very important role. Along with the visibility, we need the transparency. There is a difference between the visibility and the transparency. So what is that? Particularly visibility means what is going on and transparency gives you the idea why it is going on. If there is a change, if there is a deviation from the typical decision or there is a deviation from the standard operating procedure, then that deviation is immediately tracked and that's, that is the visibility. But why that deviation occurred, that idea is captured in transparency. So, Visibility and transparency taken together is called as a traceability. And digital twin will be particularly very much useful in supply chain in, in improving the traceability. 
So Digital Twin will be using the blockchain IoT integrated architecture along with the machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence softwares for developing the smart supply chain. Here in supply chain, there is an inbound logistics, outbound logistics, transportations, warehouse, and the original equipment manufacturing factor. So the vision of the supply chain is to optimize customer value by leveraging innovation, transparency, efficiency, and resilience in end-to-end -end supply chain process. The method is to build a virtual representation of the physical supply chain. A bi-directional real-time data exchange enables visualization, analysis, prediction, optimization of supply chain status and behavior. So our focus in digital twin of supply chain is to create the sustainable value for our client's organization supply chain network by virtual, virtual replication of enterprise to enterprise supply chain, including company and internal processes as well as third party logistics and suppliers to simulate, report, analyze, model, and automate decision-making processes. In digital twinning, we take help of the various technologies of the Industry 4.0 baskets. Cloud platforms will store the high volume data. They can analyze this high volume data Big data, it has the characteristics of high volume, high variety, and high velocity. So this big data is analyzed at the cloud computing but and the big data analytics. Then IoT, this IoT will be giving us the ubiquitous connectivity and <clears throat> it captures almost all kind of a data and transfer it to the cloud. Based on this, we can access the data 24 by 7, 365 days from any corner of the world, and we can we can come out with the necessary business inference. Artificial intelligence will be helping us to take the smart decisions, optimal decisions. Artificial intelligence will help our machines to become autonomous. Blockchain, that particular technology will be creating the time-stamped transactions. These time-stamped transactions cannot be manipulated, cannot be tampered. So any transactions across the supply chain, right from supplier suppliers to the end user, all these different, different transactions will be uploaded on the blockchain network based on the smart agreement and this um, all these transactions are loaded over there on the blockchain and distributed ledger and those cannot be tampered by anybody. Then virtual reality, augmented reality will help us to control the systems in a better manner. It will also help us in training. Fine. This is a brief idea about the application of the digital twin in the system. For example, here is a production system. Here we have in production system, machining, logistics, assembly, packaging, products, maintenance, technicians, workers. So we need to collect the data from all these different, different locations. These data are then particularly connected with the object models, scenario models, and finally, the physical data and the model data, these are fused. We have to have the services from the condition monitoring, function simulation, evolution simulation, dynamic scheduling, predictive maintenance, and quality control. Fine. This is a brief example of the digital twin and building and city. You can see that particularly there are the different layers like data acquisition layer, transmission layer, 
digital modeling layer, data modeling, integration layer, and service layer. In data acquisition layer, you can see that there are the buildings, transportation, energy infrastructure, utility infrastructure, recreational facility infrastructure, and water management infrastructure. Then in this, we are capturing the data, particularly like sensor data, weather data, energy data, security health data, then cultural background and policy. Then that is sent to the transmission layer, transmission and access network via internet, 4G, GIS. Then digital modeling layer, which will have city building information model, energy simulation model, asset information model, weather simulation model, as agent-based model, and so on. So then that is also connected with data fusion, data analysis and query, then data model and integration, data processing, data model storing and visualization, artificial intelligence, machine learning simulation engine. So here, data model integration layer will take care. Then it is connected with the service layer like security and health management, transportation management, energy management, space utilization, event prediction, asset management, and environment management. So this is a conceptual di diagram for development of the digital twin for the city. Now here, there is an idea regarding the farming, particularly sensors monitor the amount of harvested produce in the storage. The information flows into the farmer's database so that he always has the accurate idea about his current stocks. So sensors are fitted at the convenient locations on the <clears throat> different, different entities in the farm. Drones and soil sensors will help the farmers. Drones generate the field maps and deliver aerial infrared photo, providing information on the condition of the crops. Soil sensors record the water and the nutrient content of the soil. Then satellite and mobile radio antennas, data collection hub, the information collected in the field is passed on to the servers. Then commands are sent from the analysis pro platform or the farmer to the machinery, weather data from the, the radar satellite to warning systems. Then in analysis platform, the farms generate large quantities of the useful data. Providers like buyer can use this data to provide farmers with growth and ill predictions generated by their IT centers. So the farm machinery can be given targeted pesticide applications, irrigation orders. For this purpose, they also collect environmental data and comprehensive plant pathogen information that can be called up at any time to improve the crop management. Then we have the farmer robots. Highly specialized automated machines are responsible for sowing and harvesting crops. They can irrigate and apply crop protection measures with millimeter precision according to the information on the field charts. Based on this, the farmer receives the ill predictions and recommendations on the crop protections and the irrigation. On his smartphone, tablet or laptop, he knows what is happening in this field at all the times. In this manner, he can control all the entire farm conditions in the best possible manner. So digital twin, are very promising to build, bring smart farming to new level of farming productivity and sustainability. I shall briefly tell you some applications in the healthcare and then we will close. The clinical trial de design, clinical trials are expensive and time consuming and efficient. On average, 80% of the studies experience delays in enrollment and 20% of the trials fail to meet enrollment goals altogether. So what are the difficulties? The difficulties are particularly <clears throat> we don't get the right patients. Even if we get the patients, they are not ready to um, uh, share their information. They are not ready to um, cooperate. Another, uh, they may not be available at the right time. So these are some of the bottlenecks. And the bottlenecks at this stage impede the trial and ultimately delay the patient access to life-saving therapeutics. 
digital twins of trial participants can elevate several of these bottlenecks so traditionally a clinical trial includes two study groups the experimental arm which consists of trial subjects who receive the therapy under observation and the control arm which receives a non active placebo intervention then medical device design so designing customized medical devices that are compatible with individuals unique anatomical and physiological system is a challenge so several companies in the space are developing digital means of organs so for example mri images and the ecg measurements they solve systems has developed a digital twin that simulates the structure and some physiological functions of the human heart third drug development we can treat computationally a digital twin with thousands of drugs in order to identify the best one or ones that are for that specific case however this does not need to stop at the drugs that already exist we can create a digital cohort of real patients with different phenotypes we share symptoms and the test new potential drugs to predict with one has possibility to success as well as the optimal uses so that is in the drug development then patient monitoring smaller and more comfortable wearable sensors will be used to feed the real time data our digital twin in the cloud with enough understanding of the disease progression and the continuous patient data collection via health trackers we can develop models that detect symptoms at early stage given doctors and users the capacity to diagnose the patient before getting the patient ill so besides during the treatment we will be able to elevate evaluate if the treatment is being effective so there are already many sources of data that can feed our digital twin to tailor our risk factors like medical records lab test results pharmacy data wellness and disease management data well being device generated data and social data events such as zip code local weather and buying habits and the last one surgery simulations the surgery by definition is a personalized from the current state to the best outcome the surgery is tailored to the patient's needs personalization is critical to increase the intervention success and reduce the patient risk so digital twin will help by simulating an invasive clinical procedure to predict the outcome before the therapy is selected that's the beauty of the digital twinning in healthcare so here officially we will close our session if there are any questions we will go through that and i hand over the session to the coordinator thank you yes ma'am i have closed my session madam hello yes ma'am so much for your in inspiring perspective on this highly significant event thank you once again sir thank you madam may i now request uh participants to share a few words about the organizer ieerp yes uh we would like to share uh, we would like you to share a few words uh for ieerp the technical session will be starting after the lunch break yeah thank you madam
So sorry. Um, may I uh, once again call upon our participants to please share a few words um, about IFERP? Uh, virtual members and physical members would be happy to hear some words from you all, please. Would anyone like to speak? Yeah, just feedback just just yeah. regarding the organization IPRP. Uh, my friend. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, I'm from Philippines, and this is the first time that we joined a research conference um, sponsored or spearheaded by the IFERP. And we're so blessed to meet all our distinguished speakers resource speakers. We're very glad to meet all of you. And of course, all our co-presenters for this two day um, significant event. Um, at first, so hesitant because we thought it's more on the engineering and information technology. But then after we all talked, we realized that it's only about multi, uh, multidisciplinary um, discussions of new knowledge content and of course sharing of suggestions to improve the quality, not just the, the education, but the quality culture of the different institutions that we are affiliated. And we also very do, especially on my case, because my talk later on my, my research paper is actually on the internationalization of higher education institutions vis a vis school culture of quality. And I'm so excited to share with you the inputs that I have so that all together we can really provide quality or excellence in our um, organizations that we are affiliated. Uh, once again, thank you so much to each and everyone, especially to Alfred. And uh, I, I would personally uh, like to thank, of course, our uh, um, the top management in our institutions, of course, the Tamayo family, headed by Dr. Brigadier General Antonio Lapelao Tamayo, and of course, the rest of our top management, our school director, Dr. Lino Arroyo. Uh, once again, um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, sir. Anyone? <laughs> Thank you so much.
diversification leading in the transformation world. I now request Mr. Scott to kindly address the audience, please. Can someone nod? You can hear me okay? Yes, you're audible, sir. Very good. So it's my great honor to be here with all of you today. And thank you for this opportunity to speak on digital transformation and how organizations can execute on strategy in disruptive times. The World Conference on Multidisciplinary Research and Innovation, the WC MRI 2022, gives us an excellent opportunity to reflect on how management, innovation, science, and engineering can all converge to solve some of the largest problems that we're facing today. So, let's start with a, a photo, and this was taken just days before the grounding of all the airplanes for COVID-19 and the closure of, of most borders and airspace. And in this short time period, the way we all work and the way we all create value has changed. And the way that we work together has also changed. And it's remarkable how technology and innovation are helping us. If we think back just 25 years ago, the first video conference where a speaker joined by remote was with Bill Gates at Macworld in Boston, USA. And today, this is something very normal that all of us are doing and all of us are working on on a consistent basis. So the question I hear from executives, board members, and leaders around the world is, how can we execute on strategy during these disruptive times? We know that there's tremendous volatility in markets right now. In many political areas, there is uncertainty. And, and how are organizations and leaders able to use this as, as a driver for strategy? Uh, pick up any of the financial press today, and you'll see a common theme. And this is that we're coming back to the time period of 2008 uh, when we had a financial crisis that started in the United States and then spread around the world. So we're all aware that there is also financial disruption in the markets and that should not slow down innovation. On the flip side, it creates opportunity for tremendous innovation. So if we think back just a century ago and to World War I, this was the period when Boeing was founded as a company and when Rolls-Royce began to develop their aerospace business. Then we had the Great Depression worldwide and Baxter Healthcare was founded, bringing critical therapy solutions around the world and Disney launched their first animated movie. We moved into World War II and Dow Chemicals developed synthetics and penicillin was launched on the market commercially. In the 1970s oil crisis, Microsoft was founded and we were able to develop biofuels, which solved many difficult problems. In 2000, people began to say that the internet was just a fad, that it had blown up and wouldn't do anything. And yet that's when we had iTunes launched and Baidu founded. So what will 2022 bring for you, for your organizations, and for all of us around the world? This change creates opportunity for innovation. And the question really is, where do we go next? Uh, we know that in terms of economic recovery, we could look at the 80s or the 1920s, and this would mean that we could have a tremendous boom in terms of economic resources. We can also look at the 1930s and the 1970s when we had periods of stagflation. And the, the question is, no one really knows where we're going to be headed to next. But what we do know with certainty is we have to be prepared for all the different options. And at the same time, we see citizens and residents around the world putting pressure on all of us as leaders, as decision makers, to do something about sustainability. So the, the trend of sustainability is not going away. This is something that we feel pressure and that we must act on, whether we're a business person, a scientist, or a government leader. And the question becomes, how do you leverage this volatility for your strategic advantage? So. I want to look at something that has taken place in terms of strategy in the past 25 years. And when we look back at strategy, we often thought about strategy as analysis. So this would be analytical, logical, 
and linear. Uh, yet today, when we look at strategy, we're thinking much more about it as a creative and disruptive influence on our mindsets. We also started with strategy as saying it was something logical uh, in terms of our ambitions. And now business leaders, board members, and, and scientific decision makers around the world see strategy as an offensive decision making process. We also in previously thought that the future would be stable, expected to be much like the present. Yet today we know that the future is unstable and we expect it to be very different. And in terms of people perspectives, we thought of people as rational actors that would follow a, a series of activities we could predict. And yet now we know that people really are driven by passion. And in terms of business models, we looked previously at how we could preserve and tune and incrementally improve our existing business models. And today we know that we need to develop and test portfolios of new models that might be completely different from what we're doing today. In terms of main tools used in, in strategy, uh, previously we thought about SWOT, PESTLE, Value Chain, and the Porter's Five Forces. And today the tools we're using are Disruptive Innovation, the Business Model Canvas, the Strategy Innovation Canvases, and the Innovation Pyramids. We also look at change and we thought previously change was difficult and creates resistance. And yet today we say we love to create change we love to make change happen. And in terms of leading proponents, we had people like Michael Porter that previously were building very logical, rational models for us. And today we have people including Rita McGrath and Gary Hamill who say, we need to tear down the bureaucracy in our organizations. We need to eliminate the barriers that are stopping people from their innovative powers and passions. In other words, your people are better decision makers than you think. So when I look at engineering, technology, and management research together, and we talk about integrating interdisciplinary acquiries, this brings me back to the question, what is strategy in 2022? And when we think about strategy, we also have to think about disruption scales and timeframes. So going back just a couple of decades, when we talk about planning and industries such as oil and gas and energy, the, they were not very disruptive industries and the industry assumed long-term stability and that the capabilities were based on yesterday's core business models. And that although across the company, the mental models we were using may be outdated, that was okay because the industry worked in that way. And people said, this is just how things are done in our business. Then we moved into a period of strategy as normal where timeframes were getting shorter, but still board members and, and management team said, we generally prefer to play this safe with regards to strategy. Our strategy is well inside our comfort zone and our current capabilities, and is usually based on our previous successes. This moved us into a period of transformation uh, where we recognize that industries are going through significant, deep structural industry shifts, and we begin to start looking at building different models in terms of core growth and explore business portfolios. And we hear management teams, boards, investors, and stakeholders saying, we are fully committed to a decade long transformational journey. Then comes COVID and the disruption we have now around the world and organizations are saying, no, as a disruptor, I need to look at strategy very aggressively. And we need to aim to change how our industry works and we have to enjoy taking big risks. And this applies, implies that management cannot work in a silo or a vacuum. We need to be working with technology. We need to be working with engineering and understanding wh what is our role as a disruptor and how is our strategy paradigm changing. Now, what's interesting is when, when I take this scorecard, my teams and I, and we weigh this out with organizations, we can see that many boards are very comfortable in this planning stage and some are in the strategy as normal range, but all of them recognize they need to be in the transformation and disruptor range. And the question is, how do we break down these silos in interdisciplinary ways so that those decisions can become reality? One thing innovation does not equal is innovation theater. 
Now, every organization knows today they need to be talking about innovation. And in fact, if you do an analysis of the analyst and conference calls with the board and, and director and CEOs of major companies, you will hear them mentioning innovation several hundred times more per call in respect to 10 years ago. But we know, unfortunately, a lot of this is innovation theater. And what I mean by innovation theater is knowing that we need to be doing something. And so creating this, we are busy, we are innovative, etc., without really working on the tough problems that our customers and our society needs to solve. Innovation theater destroys value. It frustrates the best thinkers in science. It makes the, the leaders in engineering look for new positions or, or new companies to work for. And ultimately, you will see in share price big declines because we're not actually creating the value of innovation. And what this implies is we need new tools and new ways to link the board and the management and executive decision making with what's going on in our research and development activities. And so the first way that we found is very effective in doing this is to start by looking at market opportunities. And we can talk about four different quadrants that all drive our market opportunities, starting with technology. And the question becomes, what new technologies will be part of our future? And then we link that to, what are the trends we see on the horizon, the mega trends for society, for regulatory? What's changing and what do people want in their future? And then under, under uncovering and understanding tomorrow's customer needs. So not what the customer wants today or the incremental improvement, but how we could build together technology, trends, and customer needs to build on our own ideas. And this is where our internal innovation projects come into play and linking those back to clear market opportunities and to the strategy and the future of the organization. When we've identified those market opportunities, the majority of organizations on their innovation strategy tend to focus on these two left quadrants. They say, I'm going to build this myself, or when they get frustrated with the speed of building, they go out and they say, well, let's buy something. We can buy a competitor. We can have some mergers and acquisitions. And I'll talk a little bit later on in this speech about how that's happening today because we've seen a tremendous amount of activity in mergers and acquisitions. But they're leaving out three very powerful alternatives that could help you in realizing your market opportunities. And the first are partnerships. And those can be unlikely partnerships between the scientific community, the research community, the government ecosystems, and industry. This can also be co-investments where organizations, instead of just developing internally or buying existing companies, begin to co-invest in new startups. So we see in biotech, we see in energy, we see in agriculture, in fintech, some fantastic new startups that are developing and are able to innovate at a speed that is not possible inside large multinationals. That co-investment in new startups can unleash tremendous value and accelerate programs in realizing the opportunities of the market. And lastly, the opportunity to invest in and co-develop with accelerator programs, with hubs. We see this going on to some degree in biotech and in mobility, but there are still tremendous opportunities to partner with accelerators, co-investing with corporate venture capital, and building those unlikely partnerships between public and private collaboration to really realize the market opportunities and not just stay focused on this, this build and buy kind of areas. So every organization starts with a strategy. And when myself and our teams work with organizations, we usually talk to the board, the CEO and the management team and ask them, lay out your ambitions. And they lay out some ambitions to the future. What you see in those ambitions is they're typically very focused around the core business. Why is that? Well, the core business is what made the organization famous. It's what the company is known for and usually what they're a global leader in or, or at least a market leader in. The problem with your core business is that over time, this will not remain as a competitive advantage. And in fact, my colleague, Elvin Termer, who's the author of the book, Be Less Zombie, How Great Companies Create Dynamic Innovation, Fearless Leadership and Passionate People, explains very clearly. Your business model is under continual attack from the future. 
what made you red hot relevant yesterday has already cooled imperceptibly overnight. Someone, somewhere in the world, has figured out a better way to do some part of what you do or how you do it. Now let's go back to what most organizations are doing. They're focusing on this core business. And we can see, for example, in the difficulties VW, Volkswagen Group is having in automotive right now, their investment and focus on the diesel motor has led them to now be running to catch up. And it's a very difficult position to come from. So your core business, of course, does generate cash flow does pay the bills as we say but is not enough and this is why we need to look at growth areas and explore areas in business models now a lot of organizations go into the growth areas of business models adjacencies etc very few are comfortable in the explore areas and there are two reasons for that the first is the majority of your exploration opportunities will fail and this is part of the risk that every organization has to be prepared to take. And I'll talk about how you can use this volatility to your advantage. The second problem we have are the KPIs. So the key performance indicators of our core business are things that we all learn in, in management programs and, and are taught in school. This could be net profit, this could be EBITDA, this could be return on invested capital, IRR or WAC rates. And those are very good to assess a core business and our market share performance. However, when we get into our growth and explore areas of business, these KPIs are no longer appropriate. And what we end up often doing as business leaders and, and CFOs and finance experts is we take our KPIs from our core business and we overlay them into growth and explore business models. And you know what happens in that case, we kill enormous opportunities. Uh, last night I was speaking to someone who went to visit the last remaining blockbuster video store that's open in the world, uh, which is in Oregon, near Portland in the United States. Now, if you can imagine, just a few years ago, Blockbuster was the global leader in video. And they had some individuals come to them who had a new idea called Netflix. And these individuals said, will you invest in our company if we give you 50% of the business? And of course, the Blockbuster CEO and the board said, no, our, our core business is video rentals. And so we're not really interested in exploring this new streaming business that that doesn't have the cash flows or that we need. It doesn't meet our net present value conversations, and it certainly won't help us with our market share. So we're leaving amazing opportunities on the table in every industry and field because we're using the wrong KPIs to explain that. And just remember, no matter what your area is inside a company, inside a research laboratory, the people you are working for or the people who are funding you have their business model under continual attack from the future. This being said, change creates enormous opportunity for innovation. And, and this is a graphic that makes me very happy from the U.S. Energy and Information Administration, the EIA. Uh, when we look at coal consumption uh, compared to renewables. So coal began to be used heavily in the 1850s in the United States, and we can see it trended up for quite a while, went down a little bit in the 1970s, and then boom, up it comes again, uh, coal becoming one of the major methods of energy consumption in the United States. Then something remarkable happens. Renewables start to outpace coal. And we see today that renewables continue to grow and this opportunity for innovation creates all sorts of new business models, of new profit centers, of new ways to invest. And in fact, this came out yesterday, another graph that makes me very, very happy. The IEA, the International Energy Association, has predicted that we have reached peak fossil fuel demand. So oil, coal, and natural gas are reaching their peak demand that we will see in our history, and they just published this yesterday and, and noting that declines will begin to occur in all three of those areas as we replace them with renewables and, and new energy technologies, again, creating tremendous opportunity for innovation. So how is digital transformation actually playing out? And I want to take a brief case study and look at fintech and finance. If I go to the banks and the major financial centers in London, they all tell me, yes, we're investing very heavily in digital transformation and digital transformation is our future. And if you listen to the boards 
or the CEOs and the executives, they're telling you, yeah, we're really all in on digital transformation. So then let's look at a simple KPI. If I go to create a new bank account, how many clicks on my phone do I need to make in order for this to take place? If I look at a, a FinTech challenger like Revolut, which is a, a new organization, I could actually create an account just with 24 clicks on my phone. But if I look at the existing large legacy banks, including HSBC, Barclays, and Direct, that will take me between 74 clicks and 120 clicks. And so what this is indicating to us and what we see is that while people like to talk about digital transformation and they like to talk about innovation, we're actually in many cases just putting a digital layer on top of inefficient processes. And this is a challenge for all of you into how can we break this paradigm and, and really start to behave like the, the revolutes and the upstarts of the world. Uh, this being said, the CEO outlook continues to be challenged enormously, uh, resulting in an adjustment to st strategic investments. So EY, Ernst & Young, one of the big four, completed their CEO outlook survey in October, about two weeks ago on the 11th, and they led with one question. You have said that geopolitical challenges have led you to altering your strategic in investment plans. What is the main driver for that decision? And if we look, we talk about the pandemic, we talk about regulatory pressures, we talk about the war in the Ukraine and US and China tensions and ongoing Brexit fr friction and trade tensions. This is all driving change. And what this means for innovation is how can we make sure that we're focusing our investments where our, our stakeholders most need help for tomorrow? And this comes back to something that the former CEO at IBM said, the only way you will survive is by continuously transforming your business into something else. What does this mean? Well, this is a webinar we ran earlier this year with Alex Osterwalder, the founder of Strategizer, where we talked about transformation and the difference between explore and exploit. So explore, of course, is where we have many risks. That goes back to those growth and explore business models I showed you, and most organizations are more comfortable in the exploit. What this implies, though, is we need to have two separate teams with two separate groups of capabilities so that simultaneously the organization can be working on the explore and can also be working on the exploit. And while executives tended to say digital transformation is years away, and they said, I don't see our company having to change anytime soon, we know that COVID and recent global disruptions have completely shifted those plans and accelerated the necessity for innovation in the business. So that brings me to, you know, what is transformation? And transformation is really the significant, lasting, non-reversible change to how a company creates value. So we're really coming back to this thought of value creation. And there are three things that we see that transformation is not. One, it's not an HR program. Two, it's not digital semi-transformation, as I showed you before with the FinTech example, where we're just adding a digital layer or channels onto a platform. And three, it's not simply investing in innovation. It's not just building a corporate accelerator, joining innovation labs, establishing corporate venture funds, or acquiring a few startups. Those can be very good building blocks, but unless we start to link this to our strategy and how we're significantly shifting the value creation logic of the firm, this is just back to that innovation theater. I'm sorry, that will not work. We know, and uh, Lacani and Marco Yazanti at Harvard have done a, a deep study into why digital transformations fail, and they've come up with five reasons. Uh, the first is this unspoken disagreement about among top management about what are the goals and the priorities of the organization. The second is this divide between digital c capabilities that can support a pilot and capabilities that are available to support scaling. I was speaking with a CEO last week and what their discussion was is we're very good at running pilots. Uh, we run pilots after pilots. What we're really poor at is this scaling. So when we think about a pilot is great to test an idea, but the best organizations in the world are also very talented at being able to grab this and to start to scale. And also organizations are focusing too much on the disruptors rather than the disruption. So we hear so many automotive or mobility companies talking about Tesla or Neo, 
but we don't actually hear them talking about how are they going to disrupt the industry? How are they going to provide a better solution? A another error that is critical is to have a digital strategy that is separate from corporate strategy. And lastly, and so relevant to what we're talking about in this interdisciplinary conference today is we need to stop focusing on digital silos. So breaking down those barriers between management, research, development, and innovation, and having the teams all working together towards chasing those market opportunities and solving the hardest problems. So when we talk to CEOs, 71% of the 10,000 largest companies analyzed by Accenture say that their organization faces significant disruption, 71%. The reason this number concerns me is, I wonder what the other 29% are thinking. Because in my mind, that number should be closer to 100%. We are all facing significant disruption and need to be prepared for what that means for our careers, for our organizations, for our investments, and for our society. And this comes to one of the biggest problems, which is that business leaders and often scientific leaders tend to be constrained by industry categories or competitors. So if I talk to someone in the microprocessor business, they will talk about what Intel is doing. Or if I talk to someone in the computer business, they will talk about what Apple is doing or what in automotive, what Tesla is doing or in healthcare, what Pfizer is doing. These industry categories don't work anymore. Our new competitors are going to be startups we've never even heard of. And this brings me to one of the last things I want to cover today, which is how can you address transformation at scale? And really the way you can do this is to look at the 10 principles of transformation. And we've laid this out and, and tested this with organizations both big and small around the world. And it comes down to these 10 steps. Firstly, understand what your industry shifts are. Secondly, master new ecosystems and be able to understand how ecosystems and platforms impact your business. Thirdly, work on, as I introduced to you previously, building your core growth and explore frameworks and creating the transformation architecture for tomorrow. Then, fifthly, develop a meaningful innovation strategy, not separate from your corporate strategy, but linked to what are you as an organization and what are your ambitions for tomorrow and begin to learn how to build meaningful business model portfolios. Then you can start to master corporate venturing and building entirely new strategic capabilities, then using the money that you've generated from these activities here to invest more and then repeat. So transformation never stops. It's not a, a process with a start and an end. Rather, this is something that we have to master and become good at and learning from so that we can be successful moving forward in the future. And as our colleague Scott Anthony at InnoSight says, start before you need to. By the time the data suggests you absolutely must transform, it's often too late to do so. So when you're going back to your teams and your organization and the people that you work with and learn from, the day to start on this is, is now. Not pausing, not losing any time as we move forward. And one of the last things I'll leave you with is what we call the industry shifts map. So whatever business you're in, I see many of you are in education, in agriculture, in biotech, Think about the industry shifts that you are facing or expect to be facing in the future. And then plot how well your organization is able to respond to this. So for example, if I look at energy and aviation and technology businesses, how well are they able to respond to the changes in society and the changes and pressures of shareholders and the changes and pressures set on by technology and science? Where are, is this going and what are the deep structural changes that an industry has and that an industry will operate in? And then the question becomes, how can you use this industry shifts map in your own research? So for example, looking at clean energy, looking at distributed energy paradigms, looking at the media industry and digital or low cost transportation. There are so many examples that can help on focusing and linking the corporate strategy with innovation, research and development. I'm just going to check the chat here. We have a message from someone. Okay. Yes, I'll be wrapping up in less than five minutes. Thank you, Karthik. Uh, what I want to say is that the acceleration of the digital economy is forcing companies and deal makers to rethink strategy and will fuel our mergers and acquisitions opportunities. 
And we've seen that deal making has been very busy at the moment. And actually, while we read a lot about fundraising, uh, what we can see up until the second quarter of this year is that funding is actually increasing and most organizations are raising money at near uh, record levels. So those opportunities uh, remain. And while the United States dominates corporate venture capital funding, we see that Asia is actually leading in the number of deals or transactions. So in Asia, Europe, and the United States, we also see tremendous opportunities, and we're starting to see some areas building up in both Africa, Latin America, and a little bit in Australia and Canada. Uh, I want to leave you with one thing, and this is how companies are managing uncertainty and industry shifts to execute on their strategy in their disruptive times. And there are just a few factors here that we need to consider. Firstly, improving on strategic execution capabilities. This includes you and breaking down those silos in the business. Secondly, recognizing the importance of how external impacts link to the firm and how you can build resilience into your operational models. And then an emphasis on inclusivity and diversity underlines the need we have for new tools and incorporating these interdisciplinary teams involving engineering, technology, and management. And so, you know, the COVID crisis has shown that there are significant opportunities in meeting your users by being adaptable. And we don't want to be behind our users, we want to be ahead. And this means experimenting with and embracing trial and error and new business models and confronting those very hard questions about the future. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today. I look forward to the remaining speeches and presentations in this conference and feel free to connect with me by email or of course on LinkedIn. And I appreciate this opportunity with the World Conference on Multidisciplinary Research and Innovation. inspiring perspective on today's event. Now, without much further ado, we would now begin with our technical session one regarding latest research on bioengineering. I now welcome our participants from technical session one to please come forward with your presentations as and when I call upon your names. I would like to welcome Arifa Parveen to present Make Sustainable Green World by Using Renewable Energy. Yes, uh, my picture, uh, this is uh, moved to the right side. I saw the... Uh, OK, thank you. In fast, fast pace. Welcome. Good afternoon and welcome to all. This is Arifa Parbe. 
from Bangladesh. I would like to talk about make sustainable green world by using renewable energy. At first, we familiarize with my abstract of the study. That is, renewable energy is key of the solution of anything. Renewable energy, which is achievable, achievable is without around us, provided by the sun, wind, blow, etc. The art are renewable energy restored and transmit to earth without pollution. Solar energy have got much renewable energy that is usable in electricity, industry, business center, all over the world. So, at last, electric vehicles are also usable by solar energy. So, the goal of renewable energy is, it is environmental to the world to make a green. Now, we discuss about methodology of the study. We use here for the research survey design and collect data from the capital of Bangladesh, Dhaka, uh, which is uh, questionary from, um, that is mixed from, both qualitative and quantitative data are used here. Uh, data are collected by face to face and here use purposive sampling and simple random sampling. Data is being processed by strat statistical package for social science and MS Excel graphical application software. Back, back, back. Then, then, next, next. Graphical, graphical, graphical representation. Yours, yes. Here, we show the findings, which is analytical analysis from data. Here shows 51 percent people of Dhaka cities face the load shedding one to two hours in a day. Another graphical representation here shows that 59% people are uh, paid electricity bill 1,000 to 2,000 taka. 31% people paid 1,000, less than 1,000 taka. And 12% 12 people paid electrical bill uh, 20,000 to 30,000 taka, and 80% people paid above than 5,000 taka. Next. The another findings here uh, with, the, with the load shedding of related data, here 5.5% 
people use solar system that is solar panel uh, five percent people use IPS uh, and someone use generator and maximum percentage of people use no alternatives next here another finding shows that is this chart shows the highest 15 percent people take a step to reduce electricity uh, by uh, don't use waste electricity 90 percent turn off switch when load shedding um, four percent people uh, not use electrical appliance and one person use charger light and maximum maximum percentage of people use no alternatives thanks my next uh, here we show some calculation uh, from the uh, figure of Dhaka uh, here we show the population growth of Dhaka city in 22, 2022 there are about uh, near about 22 lakhs uh, in the past 2021 near about uh, 21 plus lakh and back to uh, 2020 20,000 population are showing here in uh, guest population capital city of Bangladesh, Dhaka. Now we show the uh, some picture uh, here. Bangladesh in, uh, Energy Regulating Commission uh, shows the unit of electricity bill that is 6.34 taka for 300 to 400 units. Here from calculation, uh, we saw the population growth about uh, to 2022. The electricity consumption, we show that near about 7,000 mega unit. Uh, in the past year, 2021, uh, we show the electricity consumption of Dhaka near about 6,000 plus mega unit. 2020 year, uh, we show 6 lakhs plus. So, it is clear the population increase related to the increasing of electricity consumption. Uh, we show the graph, we show the graph that is the per person uh, alternatives people in Dhaka use solar panel percentage is 5.5 percent. In calculation we show that uh, in Dhaka city, uh, 2022, uh, we use the solar panel per person uh, calculation about one lakh person use solar panel for 2022 year. It is the greatest consumption of solar unit. Here, a solar panel produces 40 unit electricity average per month. So, a calculation from the back per person, we show the electricity 315 unit our consumption per month. So it is converted to the 
solar panel unit it is calculated we showed that 12.68 percent of electricity per month in dhaka is needed if we alternative use of solar panel okay from this calculation we can say that if a person uh, use they can expect 12.68 percent required electricity from renewable energy and it is safe from the calculation uh, we show that approximate 90 nine, 900 mega units of electricity is used per month if we use solar panel unit so we consider this amount from renewable energy we can reduce the production of electricity from non renewable energy and per month steps to the make a green wall to use solar energy next we recommend some conclusion okay thank you so we recommend some conclusion uh, our world is now heading to a crisis of the case of non renewable energy so one day it is reverse of non renewable energy because it is will extend in some context we should store this source of categories for longer it is high time we create the public awareness of solar panel so we make some contribution to create green wall by using renewable energy we not make a green wall by a click of the computer mouse but we can start by the process of awareness intentions who should lead us to ultimate make a green wall Thank you. Thanks to all. Thank you, ma'am, for your presentation. I kindly request our participants to please to please share your presentations within seven minutes duration. I would now like to welcome Victor Kajala to present communication barriers in instructional delivery as experienced by AIMS students. in an online pedagogical environment
Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so maybe I have to put it in my... Yeah. Okay, good, uh, again, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, again, I'm also very glad to be here today. It's my first time to attend uh, with IFERP. And in behalf of my school from the Philippines, uh, Asian Institute of Maritime Studies, I'd like to share uh, a study that I have made um, with respect to the present situation that we have, which is the online uh, class. I'm pretty sure that uh, being educators also, we are having some struggle with the online class that we have, especially that uh, quality of education is the one that is concerned. So being a graduate of Doctor of Communication, I think it's my duty from my school to author a study that would probably, uh, if not uh, totally solve, but uh, at least try to give some inputs that would probably uh, give the our school and others some uh, um, solutions to the problems that are happening online. Now, um, here I uh, have my study entitled Communication Barriers uh, as Experienced by AIM Students in an Online Pedagogical Environment and Exploratory Sequential Approach. So, let me start. Um, here, Diane Elkins is the owner of Artisan eLearning. I tried quoting her. She said, I was tasked to convert a classroom course to eLearning. The instructor challenged me. He said, how can, you misly, uh, how can your misly eLearning possibly recreate all the fabulousness of my classroom experience? So this is Mr. Fabulous. That's the class that he would like to, uh, let's say, tell that it cannot be, a, um, let's say, compared to an online class. Now here, we have Bonito. So Bonito is someone that is undergoing online class. And this one is, I took it from the Google Meet Help Center. He said, why can't I, I'm sorry. OK. Why can't I uh, see nor hear my classmates and teachers? I tried restarting my Google Meet several times, but it did not work. Why, uh, what should I do? So I think uh, you have experience also with some of your students. Now, Mr. Fabulous is actually like uh, me, uh, trying to be uh, so much, uh, let's say, not so good in his feelings. Uh, here, Probably, technology has also begun to change the roles of teachers in many classrooms today. We see the teacher's role shifting to the guide on the side. So there, Mr. Fabulous is not so happy. Uh, he said, I own you with the computer. Now, another thing that would probably give us some uh, uh, background, it says here in, in a study of Gaur et al., Lack of control over the group was top perceived barrier in an online class with highest score of 261 over 394 marks. Another one from a blog, uh, Online Learning Destructions, it says there, television, family members, 
pets running in the house or siblings listening to loud music can all be sources of interruption by Botros. So you can see here, it says there, uh, sorry. There. So, okay, selfie down there. My dog is here. Am I on mute? This is my dad's shoe. And here's my mom, bananas. And one child also fell on his chair. Okay. Now, on the book uh, entitled Communication in Online Learning, Being Meaningful and Reducing Isolation, this is authored by Chomitsky. It's, he said there that regardless of how scholars, mentors, or students might describe the necessary elements for a successful online environment, communication in interaction form its core. Without a more uh, nuanced understanding of these elements, learners and educators will continue to flounder in the sometimes murky waters of online learning. So there really is a pop, indeed a communication a buyer in online uh, pedagogy. Support, uh, supporting us uh, with this, uh, I have uh, presented three literatures. First one is from Abramenka. He said they're communicating with the instructor and collaborating with peers came out as the biggest challenges in taking an online class. Another one from Arjun et al. Uh, 380 students from Alama Iqbal Open University in Pakistan face challenges in communication which affected their achievements. And lastly, in our country, the Philippines, uh, in the study of Baticolon in Alberto in 2021, uh, they said that uh, poor communication or lack of clear directions from educators was among the most experienced barrier of medical students in online learning. So with this uh, premises, I have uh, thought of making these objectives with this study. The first one is to determine the communication barriers in instructional delivery as experienced by a small number of students in our school in online learning. So here in my methods, I uh, applied qualitative, uh, undertook uh, six students to undergo a focus group discussion, and I made use of semi-structured uh, questionnaire so here I made use of convenience sampling, those students that are very near to me, and some are already my students, which I made use of them as interviewee. On number two, I made use of a, big, of a wider group of respondents. These are cross-sectional representative of students, still the same, determining the communication barriers that they have experienced. So here I applied quantitative method with cross-sectional survey of my samples and a Google Forms for the survey questionnaire. So my population here is 318 students with purposive sampling. And lastly, with my objective, I am proposing to uh, have a communication plan to strategically achieve effective instructional delivery of educational contents in an online learning platform. So here in my research framework, I was guided by the Exploratory Sequential Mix Method, or ESMM, uh, designed by Creswell and Plano Clark in 2018. So here I have actually three stages, but I included another one, became four. In the sequence one, the qualitative phase, which is the description of online learning by six uh, students, I determined their communication barriers through the FGD, in the quantitative phase, which represents sec uh, sequence two, there I made a survey of the cross-sectional students, which uh, is a total of 318. And on the third sequence, which is the data merging, I merged the qualitative and quantitative data results by analyzing them separately in the results and merging them in the discussion. And as a result, uh, it's now the basis for me to develop a communication plan to strategically achieve effective instructional delivery of educational content. Now, in the qualitative result, I came out with these uh, themes. So using the constant comparative method of Glasser and Strauss, which is the CCM, it's a bit like, uh, well, comparative to uh, thematic analysis, but uh, a bit different. So I have a lecture lesson proper uh, as one of the themes that came out. And it has a number of indicators there. 
next, uh, it came out, uh, another theme is assessment, instructional material problems. So there are numerous numbers also here. These two are classified as uh, communication barriers that are teacher-born, these two. Now on number three, a theme, it came out technology software related problems and they are numerous also. Aside from that, uh, oh, sorry, uh, I, it's a mistake with number four. This one is the technology incapacity problem. So it's just like a typo error. Sorry for that. There. So for three and four, it's actually uh, technology born problems for the last two uh, things. Out of it, now I have my quantitative results. So when I'm done, I have done with the qualitative. I explored the qualitative data to become a uh, result. With here, with an average weighted mean of 2.89, uh, well, it's, uh, it's the, uh, interpreted sometimes, but 2.89 still uh, a high, uh, well, a bit high. So AIM students express the looming problem under the lesson, uh, uh, what's this, the lecture and lesson problem domain, centric on how teachers deliver and manage instructions on the respective online classes. The communication barriers were highlighted uh, under the following statements, teachers are having a hard time getting the attention of students during class. The mean there is 3.39. And students hardly understand lesson due to varied teaching styles of teachers. Yeah, it's really hard for us to um, try to, uh, let's say, adjust ourselves because we're caught up in uh, teaching online. On the other hand, uh, though it gained a 2.73 average weighted mean. An impending problem is also elicited under the AIM uh, domain, which is the, uh, what's this? I think the, I forget the AIM there. Assessment instructional material domain. Still centric on the instructional management of teachers under assessment, uh, distinct statements were highlighted as communication barriers experienced by AIM students. First one, assignment is placed in the file section rather than in assignment bin with 3.29. Um, students are really uh, complaining with this. The instructions, uh, guides, or procedures in assignments are not clear. So this one also became a problem that were given by our students. And then uh, there, the assignment because in word format, assignment content in instruction is in word format, hence, prone to editing by students themselves. So meaning it uh, tries to alter the original instruction given by the teacher. Yeah. Next one for the technology software related uh, problems. So again, though interpreted as sometimes, the AIM students manifested uh, technology and software related problems as the greatest communication. Sorry to interrupt. Could you please conclude in two minutes, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Okay. So, three distinct problems. The surface, there is a delay in the audio of MS Teams, lagging of presentation during class, and then choppy delivery of discussion of lessons to unstable internet connection. So, still, uh, the TIP now is the lowest one, which is the technology and capacity with a weighted mean of 2.41 there. So with that, with my last slide, the AIM students uh, express two major concerns with respect to the communication barriers they have experienced in the instructional delivery of lessons and materials in an online modality. So the first one is the online uh, teaching management, which is uh, the two themes that came out. And the second one is the te technological efficiency. So part of which would be the uh, part of the uh, teacher and also the students trying to manage how to navigate the uh, software and also of course because of the internet and other aspects that try to affect the operation of the uh, software. So here the proposed communication plan, uh, uh, I have this uh, taken from a number of literatures. Um, the fourth one is a uh, counterpart of those that has high means. So first one, grabbing a, a student attention, there is a uh, communication plan that I took from Job. Another one is interactive teaching style, taken from Ilya. 
The third one is the practical written experience from Gaudet. And lastly, effective synchronous class recitation tips from Minero. So there. And that end, this is my documentation photos for my data gathering. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. I would like to welcome M. Atif to present photoacoustic imaging to predict tumor, hypoxia, and cell survival. Okay, no problem, this guy understands. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, I am highly thankful to the organizing committee of this conference for inviting me to talk about on our uh, topic. This is a biophotonics topic. It is on the photocaustic imaging to predict uh, tumor hypoxia and cell survival. This is a collaborative research program between the King South University Riyadh and the University of Toronto, Canada. And uh, the introduction of my talk is this, uh, that uh, we have analyzed uh, to pr predict uh, how, how much is the tumor size and what are the techniques we use. We use uh, a technique called photodynamic therapy, bioluminescence imaging to quantify blood flow, volume, things like that. So an ecological treatment aim to move towards personalized medicine, increased tissue response monitoring has been become the focus of our research. So in particular, we have practically resolved in vivo information of hypoxia and its relationship to cell survival. To, uh, uh, this is uh, that our target. So the techniques which we are used, this is uh, one is called photocaustic imaging and the bioluminescing imaging BLI to uh, image the blood flow and the volume. So this is the technique uh, which is uh, uh, used for this purpose. This is called photodynamic therapy. It is a, a light is combined with photosensitizer in the presence of oxygen. This is in a simple, if we combine all these factors together, it will generate a photochemical reaction and that will lead uh, 
to this uh, tumor necrosis, which is uh, called the photodynamic therapy. And this is a selective treatment, and uh, the photobiochemical process involved are highly complex, and therefore treatment parameters for uh, optimal therapeutic e efficacy are difficult to predict. So these are the uh, uh, regarding this one dosometry, CDT dosometry. These are the different terms which we use for uh, homogeneous and non-homogeneous dose distribution over the region, requiring PDT, and also evaluates in a quantitative fashion dosing of normal tissues. So these are the uh, different factors which we require. This, they, they are involved in light, photosensitizer, and the oxygen. In light, what is the wavelength? What is the fluence rate? Distribution, whether you, you use the CW or the pulsed laser, and whether you stop uh, the laser light for some period, this is called a fractionation. In oxygen, we mean the distribution, diffusion rate, depletion rate, vascular response, and photosensitizer. Uh, we have administrated dose, tissue concentration, and cellular localization. And this is there regarding the tissue sensitivity. And then this is the uh, administrative dose is proportional to the quantity of singlet oxygen produced. And these are the, uh, and photo bleaching may be an indirect indicator of PDT dose. So these are the, uh, these are actually the aims of our study are the objectives of our study. Basically we are uh, used to predict tumor hypoxia for photodynamic therapy. Uh, monitoring to predict cell survival. The techniques photocaustic and bioluminous signals are used to detect vascular changes during and post PDT. In the we investigated this one. So these are this one. These are the uh, different uh, methodologies to prepare the cells, and this we use here human prostate uh, uh, cell lines, which is PC3, and this these are the concentrations which we used 100 micromolar phosphate buffer solution and the photosensitizer where we used a BPD, benzenine, porophene derivative and the other things is the drugs which we used ALA and these one and this uh, used uh, and the wavelength which we used uh, to monitor is 780 and 830 nanometer to, to determine oxy and deoxy hemoglobin concentration to obtain the blood volume and oxygen this one so these are the results of uh, our study um, before uh, when it is a pre pdt there these are the absorption maps post pdt 4 hours and 24 hours so this is uh, is evaluated using different uh, time domain and this is uh, uh, the uh, we have evaluated the rate of oxygen change for the one drug which is ALA at low and high dose, how they looks like. This is here showing uh, the uh, here ALA and these are BPD and BPD with low and high dose. And the for BPD, uh, a very rapid loss in the blood saturation is for the vascular acting photosensitizer, which is rapidly recovering upon completion of PDT, suggesting a high degree of PDT mediated oxygen consumption. And then we have also observed uh, this one, the rate of change of blood volume, which is uh, the oxygen uh, for a very rapid loss in uh, blood oxygen saturation is for vascular acting photosensitizer, which is rapidly recovering upon completion of PDT, which means that a high degree of PDT mediated oxygen consumption. So the, these are the different responses uh, we, which we have uh, observed during these two photosensitizers. As you can see here, for ALA, at low, ALA and low and high dose of BPD, uh, the, for BPD mediated rapid loss is, is uh, observed. Uh, while uh, upon completion, this is uh, uh, the other thing is uh, this is the uh, reduced vascular demand is possibly driven by tumor cell death. So this is uh, another uh, slide showing uh, 
scatter plot of blood volume versus BLI indicates that blood volume oxygenation changes uh, representing cell metabolic activity including cell death. So these are the different, uh, what are we conclude from this talk is uh, can you can you show the conclusion please? for this uh, study and uh, sponsored by King Abdullah City for Science and Technology and thank you very much for uh, providing me the opportunity to present my uh, experimental results. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you sir for the presentation. I would now like to welcome Michelle Lee S. Victorino to present Tracing the Employability Success. <laughs> I don't is is it showing or Is it showing? Another, 
It's not showing screen, screen, screen. You want to do two zoom? I can get them. You give me a lot. I get it.
consider. Yes, it's a link. Kind apologies for the technical delay. Um, Ma'am will present it, present it in the next following. Yes, speaker. Thank you so much, Ma'am. Okay. Now, moving forward, I would like to welcome uh, Lengu Janil to present the impact of green intangible asset state equity participation on Indonesia performance. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I will present uh, about my uh, paper, uh, the impact of a green intangible asset state equity participation, green asset on Indonesia performance. Uh, state of the enterprise. Indonesia have uh, more than 100 uh, company uh, state on enterprise this is uh, my uh, biography I'm assistant professor and
Trisakti University and uh, Indonesia National Research and Innovation. Uh, I am a director Indonesian Defense Industry 2 uh, and a director strategic industry industry in science and technology minister uh, of research and technology uh, 2014 and till uh, 2016. My abstract, uh, the contribution of uh, SOE in Indonesia still low, not optimal uh, because uh, even re uh, decreasing in the, the for the government seek to improve the company performance uh, by providing state equity participation uh, which is uh, expected to increase in, uh, company performance uh, therefore uh, this study aim uh, empirical examine in the effects that uh, participation equity green asset and green intangible asset uh, on financial performance uh, the data uh, include 2090 to uh, 2021 uh, the unit analysis in SOE which is uh, received uh, PMN, we call the state equity participation uh, using primary data and data processing using smart PLS questions, uh, equation model. Uh, uh, the research is uh, equity, uh, quantitative research. Hey, sorry. Uh, literature review, intangible asset play a vital role in the success and survival of uh, firm in today economy and SOE participation uh, as an effort for national economic recovery for SOE is needed because SOE uh, have a vital role in Indonesian national economy and the third the green uh, asset indicator uh, it's measure uh, from three aspects are uh, environmental, social, and financial uh, factor. Uh, in Indonesia, proper is an environmental uh, invest program implemented by Indonesian Ministry of uh, Environment. And green asset uh, being uh, company to improve the uh, economic performance by finding new market uh, product differentiation uh, increasing sales and in-hand uh, competitive advantage and corporate image uh, the, pre the performance of other company can be seen the uh, on the financial performance generated uh, with the uh, certain uh, period and other This is a concept to a framework. Uh, uh, we related with the uh, state equity participation in Indonesia to performance. Uh, performance uh, is measured by uh, return on equity asset and then return on equity, and related uh, the impact of. Uh, green asset to performance and uh, the impact of uh, green performance asset green intangible asset to performance and uh, we measure to uh, to competitive advantage the indicator of uh, export and uh, growth uh, uh, the finding uh, we can see the uh, outer model the the all uh, more than uh, 0 0.05 and uh, the model uh, fit and goodness of fit and uh, we can see to uh, the variable the the all uh, really uh, affect the uh, dependent variable and only uh, 
green intangible asset not uh, effect the uh, competitive advantage in Indonesia. In Indonesia, uh, green intangible asset is uh, not important like now. The uh, result. So, uh, convergent validity, discriminant validity, and more than zero point five. It uh, mean uh, the model uh, goodness of it too. Uh, this is a uh, inner model. You can see the the all uh, more than uh, zero point zero. The conclusion: uh, green intangible asset uh, effect and uh, no effect performance SOE and state equity participation effect performance SOE and green asset effect performance SOE and Indonesia performance SOE effect competitive advantage and green intangible no effect uh, competitive advantage and state equity participation effect competitive advantage and uh, green asset effect competitive advantage too uh, and performance SOE have effective competitive advantage. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, ma'am, for the presentation. I would now like to welcome Husna Lumapinit to present effectiveness of self-learning modules on students in English amidst pandemic. My warmest greetings and appreciation to all the participants throughout the you know, or from other parts of the world, and especially to our organizers. Good afternoon. So I am Dr. Husnati Lumapinet. I am a faculty in the College of Education at Cotabato Foundation College of Science and Technology that is located in Duruluman, Arakan, Cotabato, Philippines. So our school is located in the Mindanao part of the Philippines. So since I am a faculty in the College of Education, my research here is related to teaching and learning. So my paper here is entitled Effectiveness of Self-Learning Modules on Students Learning in English Amidst Pandemic. Next slide, please. For the rationale of my study, during the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, it has brought catastrophe to our society. And, and the field of teaching has been greatly affected. So the traditional way of teaching sw switched into the utilization of the modules as well as the blended learning. So that is why in the Philippines, the Department of Education implemented the learning continu continuity plan with the use of the learning modules. So by that, the teachers, the students, and also the parents find it extremely challenging. So that is according to Bootshell in 2022. Next slide, please. The purpose of my research is to identify the effectiveness of these self-learning modules on the students learning in English in times of pandemic. Next one, please. My research design is quantitative research, which employed a quasi-experimental design to determine how effective is this learning modules. Next one. The respondents of my study were the 100 grade 10 secondary school students in English, particularly those schools located in North Cotabato Division, so these participants are, you know, selected through probability sampling, particularly equal allocation. Next one. In my data gathering procedure, a pre-test and post-test were administered by the teacher to identify the effectiveness of these modules. Next one. 
For the data analysis, the data collected were analyzed using the frequency, the percentage, and the t-test. Next. For the result of my study, uh, Table 1 shows the academic performance of the students. In this particular research, it is being indicated or measured by administering here an examination which is composed of the summative test 1 and the summative test 2. As you can see here in the result, it has a description, of course, of very satisfactory uh, from the summative test 1 to and also with a grand mean here, which I forgot to put the uh, description, which is also very satisfactory. So the description there is based on the standard given by the Department of Education in the Philippines. So you, you're going to see there the scaling, the description, and the rating if it is passed or failed. Next one, please. And for Table 2, it shows the significant difference between the pre-test and the post-test to the st of the students in the five modules in English. So this was, you know, this was analyzed using the compar comparison t-test. So there are five modules here, and as you can see in the result, there is significant difference. And this significant difference result means that, you know, this learning module improved the, uh, you know, the learning of the students. So this favors the uh, post-test, which shows that there is increase during the post-test when the uh, learning modules are administered to the pupils or to the students. Next one, please. And for the conclusion of my study based on its result, it can be concluded that the modular approach in teaching and learning can help the students in the new normal education. On the academic performance of the students, it is, you know, very satisfactory. Next one, please. And the achievement of the learners. Going next one, please. The next one. Previous one, rather. Okay, that one. The achievement of the learn the modular the achievement of the learners as indicated by their GPA is very satisfactory. Yeah? So which means that they are gaining knowledge with the use of these self-learning modules. And last one. Last one, please. Okay. The test scores of the students in English significantly improve in the post-test, so which, can, which means that these learning modules are very effective. So this ends my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am, for the presentation. I now welcome... Michelle Lee S. Victorino to present facing employability success. Sobsoblina na ko rin din nag-burnout. Sorry more ni Frederick kaya nag-burnout at tayo. Ang ba itong bigat kayo mag-present? Papay lang. Ang bigat kayo mag-present? Magka po kayo, Jay Samuel? Okay. 
Icebreaker. <laughs> oh. oh, all right. Okay. All right. I think I have to start. All right. A blessed afternoon, everyone. So, my name is Michelle. Lay Victorino, I am from Philippines, and I will discuss to you our study about tracing the employability success. Okay, so together with other uh, researcher, with Miss Jessa Frida Festijo and Joanna Juviv Joy Rojo. Okay, um, this is my bio note. A little bit brief, brief background about myself. I am a senior researcher at the research and innovation center at LPU Manila and also a full-time faculty or university educator rather at the College of Arts and Sciences and also an adjunct uh, specialist at the graduate school of LPU Manila. So currently I am I am a PhD student under P, uh, public policies and management student. Okay? I got a little bit confused. That's my picture uh, 10 pounds ago. <laughs> All right. So for abstract, next, please. Next. Okay. So the study is aimed to trace the success of employability from 2002 to 2021 of the graduates in LPU Manila. So we employed descriptive method, okay, and Pearson correlation analysis are utilized, okay. From that study, we generated 477 respondents who participated in the study. Also, the findings yielded um, invaluable insights for curriculum development and program refinement. Next, please. Okay, so the Philippine labor economy has become competitive for job seekers as they are classified in terms of the degree programs they have, the school that they attended to, and the competencies and skills they acquired during their study. The employability rate, next slide. The employability rate of graduates is one of the key factors in the improvement of quality instructions of any higher education institution. In addition, they are responsible for honing the skills and developing core competencies of graduates to help contribute to economic growth and development, both national and international level. It also a crucial, has a cru crucial role okay, to play in the development of program curriculum of schools and their strategic direction towards recruitment and retention. Okay. So the LPU or the Lyceum of the Philippines University of Manila concurred with the Commission on Higher Education of the Philippines to conduct a graduate tracer study. So what is graduate tracer study all about? It is to improve the quality and relevance of trainings and educations provided by the higher education institution to their graduates. So part of the minimum criteria of instructional quality 
of a degree program to be identified as either a center of excellence or a center of for development. Okay, next slide, please. This mandate enables higher education institutions to improve their policies in terms of decision making on creation, retention, and expansion of academic programs offerings. So the tracer study allows HEIs to estimate the career trajectory of their produced graduates in terms of analyzing the job search time for the moment of their graduation. Next slide, please. Furthermore, it allows the examination of institutions provided training graduates, career paths, employment kind of position, professional and job satisfaction, and regional dispersion. So this in the photo is the recently held um, commencement exercise from LPU Manila. Okay? Thus, the general objective of the study is to determine the relevance of LPU core values in the employability rate among the graduates of LPU. It also evaluates learning outcomes of program curricula in relation to quality assurance and industry relevance. So here are the some of the, okay, some of the specified uh, objectives. We will determine the demographic characteristics in terms of gender, year graduate, and degree programs. We also consider getting the status of employability of nature of employment, reasons for staying in the job, length of time, um, getting hired, considerations in pursuing advanced studies, and the competencies relevant in the respondent's first job, and lastly, significance of identified work-related values, length of time. So here are the results for design and methods, rather. The study employed cross-sectional survey via online Google Forms to reach out to our respondents between February to May 2021. So the survey was part of a HORT study composed of the four campuses of LPU. So the GTS or the Graduate Tracer Study is um, serve as a survey instrument tool lifted from CHED or the Commission of Higher Education of the Philippines. So we use the Microsoft Excel and Jamovi, which is a statistical um, analysis software used to analyze the data obtained. Also, the researcher um, employed ethical consideration um, to be followed. Okay. Next, slide, next slide, please. So here are the results. For the results, we gather a total of 477 graduates of LPU Manila participated in the study. At it com it compromise a compro comprise of 58.3 females and 41.7 males who participated in the study. Next slide. Next slide. So these are the degree programs. 23.1% um, of most of them come from international tourism and hospitality management management as this supports that the degree is one of the top program in LPU, followed by foreign service, management accounting, information technology, and lastly, the two, the two program under the cruise line operation in culinary arts and customs administra administration. Next slide, please. For employment status, around 272 landed a regular or permanent position in their present employment how uh, others are 65 or 30 13.6 are self-employed which includes freelance work or having own businesses okay next slide reasons for staying jobs um the top most okay the top most um reason is under consideration on salaries and benefits, followed by the challenges in the field of their career. Lastly, the jobs related to course or program they took, ah, sorry, and rather, lastly, their jobs are related to their special skills. Next slide, please. For the job search time, okay, while our, um, the graduates are hard or mostly hard within six month period after their graduation, while others are hired less than a month after they graduated. And lastly, only 
0.4% are hard after a year or less than a two years. Okay, next slide. For the acquired competencies, okay, the topmost acquired competencies in the um, of the graduates is the communication skills, followed by critical thinking skills. Only a small difference, uh, difference in fraction with problem solving skills, uh, human relation skills, and course related skills. Next slide, please. So we rank the following work-related values among the LPU graduates. So we identified 17 attributes and come up with six topmost value. So number one is perseverance and hard work, followed by professional integrity. Third, honesty and love for truth, followed by efficiency, punctuality, and obedience to superior. So it is noting that nationalism is uh, released among the among the seventeen work related values with four four point thirty two mean average. Okay, so as person correlation analysis use only efficiency showed significantly Hello, related to their uh, job search time with um, zero point zero. Hello. Okay, so for conclusion, next slide, please. Okay, so for conclusion, most of the respondents gainfully employed between one to six months after graduation while securing a regular or permanent position. This is an indicator of successful employability in terms of job search time from what they have landed their first job. Additionally, it is work efficiency that shows high relevance in terms of landing their first job after graduation. Okay, so last slide is, thank you very much for your attention and listening. This is my email address. Hope that we connect some other time. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for the presentation. I would now like to welcome Heherson S. Cabrera to present prediction of a novel epitope-based peptide vaccine against plasmodium falciparum i'm sorry yes ma'am welcome sir Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So today I'm going to present uh, this paper entitled Prediction of a Novel Epitope-Based Peptide Vaccine Against Modium Falciparum, an Immune Informatics Approach. So this research was carried out by uh, my colleague Maria Arian David and myself. My name is Heherson Cabrera. A little bit of background about myself. So, um, where's the next one? Uh, before that, please. Okay, so by profession, I'm a chemical engineer. I'm also a chemist, and also I graduated with a degree of biotechnology all in 2014. And recently, I um, graduated with the degree on biological engineering. So my research interests include tissue engineering, bioinformatics, and computational biology. Next slide, please. And can you remove this part, please? Hello, sir. Do you want to 
change the slide? Uh, Ma'am, there is a breakout room page open. Could you please close it? Yes, ma'am, please wait. I'll check and let you know. If you can, if you can. Okay. Can we use our slide? Can we connect it from here? So you can proceed, sir. Ma'am, you need to close the breakout room, please. We are not able to see the screen over here. Minimize this page, please. This is currently your site. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, they just need to close the. Yeah. Can I 
Yo soy. Okay, so let me continue. Um, can we go to this one, please? So uh, if I were to ask you what would be the most dangerous animal on planet Earth, you might say lion or the shark or some kind of snake. But actually, according to CDC, um, it's actually the mosquito, which is the most, one of the most dangerous animals on planet Earth. And the reason is that the mosquito, can you go to that slide, please? Next, next. One more. Yep. So the mosquito is actually a vector to a variety of diseases that includes uh, the Zika virus, yellow uh, fever, what else, dengue, and also malaria. So for this uh, study, we focus on malaria. And malaria, as we all know, is a life-threatening um, disease which is caused by these viruses. One is Plasmodium falciparum, and to some extent, Plasmodium vivax. So Plasmodium falciparum is actually the has the greatest threat in comes, uh, when it comes to mortality, and Plasmodium vivax is more widespread. And uh, it is transmitted to people through the bites of infected female uh, Nophilis mosquitoes. Next slide, please. Okay, so as you can see here, uh, from, 20, uh, from the year 2000 up to around 2019, so there's a steady decline on the mortality rate of malaria. However, beginning in 2019, there's a slight increase up to now, or around the year 2020. And although if, let's say, the downward trend continued, it's still a significant uh, number. We have here six, uh, 600,000 deaths in, I think, 20, uh, up to 2019 alone. So would you go to the next slide, please? Here, I'm showing you the world map, and it includes here some regions which are, until now, are malarious, meaning we have still cases of malaria. And that includes um, portions of South America, Africa, and South Asia or Southeast Asia. Next. Now, there have been attempts to integrate the tools of computational biology and bioinformatics to the field of immunology, especially in the development of vaccine. So for example, in a paper um, by Ismael and colleague in 2020, so they utilize the spike protein of the coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2, and from there they develop or they um, predicted what are the epitopes. Epitopes are actually portions of the antigen or the pathogen that interacts directly to the immune system cells. So from there, they were able to predict lots of epitopes. They assembled that into a singular subunit protein. They tested it and they validated it using simulations. So in this study, we're going to do just that. Would you go to the next slide? And uh, here we are going to utilize the circumsporozoite protein. And the reason why we use this protein is number one, it's found on the surface of the parasite, which is plasmodium. And secondly, there have been measurements made in the past wherein there's a high concentration of anti-CSP antibodies from those who were infected. So next slide. So what we did here is we're going to, or we did uh, predicted epitopes or antigenic determinants from the protein CSP. So for example, the antigenic determinants that interacts with cytotoxic T cells, okay, were predicted there were three of them. So the scheme is like this, no? So we were able to predict it using a certain server called NetCTL, and NetCTL is a server that um, calculates the binding efficiency of a protein in our cells called major histocompatibility complex. And that binding efficiency was utilized um, utilizing a machine learning algorithm so that we were able to predict hundreds of epitopes. We have to filter it out, removing those that are not immunogenic, not antigenic, and also those that are toxic and are allergenic. So again, we were able to predict three epitopes. Next. And we did the same for us to predict uh, epitopes that will be able to be recognized by the helper T cell. It, there's one of that. And for the B cells, we were able to predict nine epitopes. So there are a total of nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 epitopes in total. And what we will do here, what we did is we assembled these sequences. And next. Uh, 
And once we assemble those amino acid sequences coming from the uh, pathogen or coming from the epitopes, here we were able to develop a vaccine construct. So this vaccine includes vital sequences. Number one, it includes what we call an adjuvant. An adjuvant is what we include in a vaccine so that the immune response will be enhanced. And of course, the epitopes are there. They were assembled. They were linked by a variety of linkers with, uh, such as EAAK, we have KK, we have AAY. Those are amino acid sequences. Uh, next, please. Once we have designed the vaccine construct, we were able to uh, map out the epitopes, meaning we have to prove that the epitope should be on the surface of the protein. Because otherwise, if the epitope is buried, it will not be interacting with the cells of the immune system. And we, here, we were able to prove that by modeling, and it fa it's found that it's indeed uh, not uh, buried, but rather exposed, and that will be able to interact directly with the immune system cells. Next. And uh, finally, we, we are able to uh, characterize the performance of our vaccine construct. So when we um, assembled the vaccine construct in silico, of course, or computationally, we were able to prove that upon exposure to the vaccine construct or to the antigen, um, we were able to enhance the development of antibodies. And also, you might not be able to see it from here, but we were also able to have an expression of different um, B cells. So we have here population of B cells increasing as well as T cells, both cytotoxic and helper T cells. However, for helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells, after some time, maybe around 50 weeks, the concentration went down. And that means uh, there is a need for further exposure to the vaccine construct for us to have a stable um, concentration of these kinds of cells. Next. Um, same is true with so we have to identify whether the performance of our vaccine or whether our vaccine construct will be able to induce cytokine. So indeed, according to the simulation, we have an increase in the number of interferon gamma, interleukin-2. However, for the other cytokines, they were not quite developed. But what's important here is that the interferon gamma and the uh, interleukin-2, because these are chemokines that will be able to trigger the action of macrophages, neutrophils, natural killer cells, meaning to say our vaccine construct will be able to trigger the uh, uh, response or rather the action of these kinds of cells. Next slide. We carried out population analysis. So in here, we calculated whether each region in the world, you know, whether it's Southeast Asia, South America, and so on, will be able to receive well our vaccine construct. And true enough, the global uh, or the worldwide population coverage, we, were, uh, we calculated that to be around 99.96%. That means that majority of the population will be able to receive well the vaccine construct that we made. Next. So for the conclusion, um, we were able to predict three T-cell epitopes, one HTL and nine um, B-cell epitopes. We predicted its performance, we simulated it in silico, and uh, we found out that majority of the regions have 70% coverage. Uh, Physico-chemically, although I were, was able to show that here, uh, the design was predicted to be stable, thermostable, and has suitable properties. And um, according to our immune simulation, it showed typical immune responses after exposure to the antigen. There is, there's an elevated uh, immune response in terms of the B cells and the T cells. And this is important because um, we don't know whether, uh, when will the next epidemic or pandemic will come. So we have to be ready. We have to fast track, accelerate the vaccine development process. And we can have computational biology and bioinformatics to aid us in doing so. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. I would now like to welcome Kimberly and Samante to kindly present yeah. Virtual Temptation, a descriptive analysis of lewd risk behavior of Filipino adolescents in University of Philippines. 
thank you. I would request to wait for two minutes. We are creating the uh, breakout room for the parallel session. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, kindly close that notification box to see the uh, screen. You will have to close it from your side. All right, so a pleasant afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. Before we start, I would like to invite everyone to please stand up. Yes, let's uh, stand up and uh, yes. So can we please, everyone, shake our hands? Yes, because I know that since a while ago, you are all bored <laughs> already and tired. So shake our hands. Come on, everyone. And all, also, please do shout, huh? All right, so please take your seats now. All right, once again, a pleasant afternoon to everyone. It is my honor to present to you my study entitled, can you please um, click the next slide button? From the person in the India? Oh my God, please. Okay. <laughs> okay, LDR. Okay, wait. Be, oh, return. Return. <laughs> Back, you know. <laughs> All right, so everyone, it is my pleasure to present to you my study entitled Virtual Temptation, a Descriptive Analysis of Lewd Risk Behavior of Filipino Adolescents. But before that, I would like to introduce myself first. I am Dr. Kimberly Ann S. Cantilero from the University of Perpetual Health from the beautiful place of Philippines. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, I love this topic. I really love. So let me start. Let me start by sharing to you an introduction of my study. Apologies because this is my handout. Okay, so today, kids and adolescents don't even have to sneak to find anything no, online. It can actually be found on Snapchat, on Instagram, it can be found on Telegram or WhatsApp groups. Things have changed radically. It can, in fact, anywhere the child has a device that's hooked up to the internet. Dr. Edward Connor, a licensed psychologist in Kentucky, Ohio, and Indiana, says that children are being exposed to porn at younger age. If he is viewing porn on a regular basis at age 11, come on, it's going to have to be progressively more stimulating for him as he becomes a teenager and becomes a young man. It becomes almost impossible for that young man to have a normal, healthy sexual relationship with a partner. As they're watching, they, uh, there are a lot of subliminal messages going into their brain. 
Can you imagine, again, the amount of aggression, the excitement, let tingles, tingling sensation they're feeling, no? Because they're not focusing on the aggression when they're watching videotapes or online uh, video pornography. They're actually focused on different body parts and there lies the objectification of sexuality. So the subliminal messages of aggression, though they are entering the brain, they have uh, this belief that I must act the same way. It's problematic because it's giving children false impression of what human sexuality is really about. It's not the prudish concern at all. It's a mental health concern. My dear educators, presenters, wait. We have seen an increase in the amount of pornography being used by young children, teenagers, and even adults. Many who it's destroyed their marriage or their relationships because of the pandemic and social, social isolation. A lot of people have turned to the internet for various reasons. Imagine that. Whether it's overspending on pornography or just spending a lot of wasted time on the internet. Top viewing hours for pornography are around 11 p.m., midnight to 1 a.m., and still continuously growing presently because nobody is watching eh. Am I right? Nobody is watching. They're doing it privately. Right? Am I right? And you, you can, you can, uh, you can share your own stories. Kidding aside, next slide. Ayan, so we have Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, and Telegram, and a lot more, and different um, pornographic sites. Next slide, please. Thank you. All right. So virtual temptation is a growing phenomenon not only in Western world but among ASEAN countries. It is a stage marked by a rapid development and emphasis in sexuality in people's lives. This is a time when there is an increase of sexual ideation and sexual exploration. Next slide, please. Well, let's proceed to the statement of the problem of my study. Next. All right. So first, how may the personal profile of the participants be described in terms of age, sex, and grade point average? Next. For the statement number two, how may the sexual behaviors of the participants be described in terms of the following? First, exposure on the virtual temptation. Second, these types of virtual temptation material or media platform. Next is the causal factors on the exposure on, vir on virtual temptation. And lastly, impact on virtual temptation to their behaviors. Next slide, please. All right. Okay. So this study utilizes the descriptive design using a qualitative research approach. The descriptive method through qualitative data was likewise utilized for the gathering and tabulation of data. It involved the elements on or interpretation of the meaning or significance of what was being described. Description was combined with comparison and contrast involving interpretation and narration of the collected response of the participants during focus group discussion. Thematic analysis through manual descriptive coding of data was utilized to ensure the accuracy of participants' answers. The questionnaire was the chief data gathering instrument in eliciting the information gathering or regarding the implication of virtual temptation to the participants' sexual behaviors. Purposive sampling technique, a non-probability sampling method was used. All right, okay. next slide.
Okay, so for the participants, we have 10 participants from first-year college students of university. I will not mention the name, of course. For the confidentiality, academic year 2018-2019, were identified and purposively selected as participants of the study. The research data has been gathered mainly through survey questionnaire and interview-guided questions. Survey questionnaire was employed in collecting the personal data of the participants, such as the grade point average, age, and gender. Thus, the interview-guided questions were given to the participants in evaluating the impact of virtual temptation. The interview mainly focused on knowledge, experience, and values of the participants. Okay? So for the ethical consideration, of course, we do have the confidentiality. And during the interview, we have a mental health professional. Okay? So just in case there's a sensitive um, conversation, we have someone to guide us. Okay? Next slide, please. Thank you. All right, so I will make this as fast as I can. So for the first result, no, what is the demographic profile of the participants be described? Most of the participants got 80% to 84% grade point average with the mean age of 18 years old and a larger proportion of male participants participated in the study. Next slide, please. Okay, so for the part two, for the impact of virtual temptation on participant sexual behavior, participant gave common responses that the reason of their exposure on virtual temptation were gratification. Can you see that? Em express sensuality due to boredom. They're bored. And the state of their mentality. Next. So for the types of virtual temptation materials they used or the platform, the type of virtual temptation that most of the participants uses was online pornography, porn sites, ebooks, porn games, videos, website, novel, and personal computers. Sexual behavior. Okay. For the third table, we have the type of virtual temptation materials. Uh, actually, I'm on there. Next slide. Okay, so table four presents the causal factor. What are the factors on the exposure on virtual temptation? First is environmental pressure. Okay, so next is the sexual satisfaction. And lastly, due to boredom. Okay. Next slide, please. Thank you. And last slide, yes. Table 5, impact of virtual temptation to behaviors. So, sad to say that the impact of virtual temptation to behavior um, stated here that uh, it gave huge such addiction, sexual satisfaction, and sense of responsibility. Their specific reason of keeping using virtual temptation were it become habitual, serve as their stress reliever, pleasure, gain idea, and become aggressive in sex, learn and want experience, but they accentuated that they still know their limitations. All right, next slide, please. All right, so I won't, uh, I won't uh, explain to you the summary because I already um, stated a while ago the tables. No? So let's proceed to the conclusion and recommendation. Okay. Uh, can you return to the last slide? Okay, so return, pa. last one more. Okay, so based on the findings and conclusion, uh-huh, okay. Conclusion, please. Thank you. One more. 
Okay. So for the conclusion and recommendation, most of the adolescents nowadays engage themselves into virtual temptation like websites, games, videos, movies, and porn sites. Next, most of the participants gave common responses that pornography online is the most accessible type of virtual temptation. Third, adolescents use pornography that increase rates of their depression, anxiety, acting out, and violent behavior, younger age of sexual debut, sexual promiscuity, increased risk of teen pregnancy, and a distorted view of relationships between men and women. Moreover, research suggests that teen teenagers who watch pornography, especially from the internet, have lower degrees of social solidarity, increases in conduct problems, higher levels of delinquent behavior, higher occurrence of depressive symptoms, and decreased emotional bonding with caregivers. Although the relationship between the amount of internet usage and the sexual behavior has not solidity proven yet, Girls and boys have already reported feelings of inferiority after being exposed to subjects in pornographic materials. Decreased social development has also been noted. Next. Okay, so for the fourth conclusion, the exposure to sexual material in the media is related to having sex but not necessarily risky sexual behavior among otherwise similar youth. According to the study conducted by, I will, I will not read it. Okay, let's proceed to five. The researcher will able to determine a causal relationship between virtual temptation and sexual behaviors as per the assumption made by Bandura's social cognitive theory of observational learning and cultivation theory as its simplicity to have proper grasp of the complexity of the issue. Okay, next slide. Next slide, please, for the recommendation. Based on the findings, what are the following recommendations? First, the school may formulate a tangible guidance intervention program that will address adolescents' awareness to the risk of pornography online. Second is the findings of this research paper opens up the discourse on certain topics. The fact remains that the participants of the research remains far from optimal to present, a holistic picture of Filipino adolescents. It cannot be denied that an overwhelming percentage of the participants of the research are Roman Catholics and part of the students' cohort, which is only a certain portion of the entire or entirety of Filipino adolescents, which carries with it, um, with it its own biases. Third, the discussion on how adolescents associate different virtual temptation is different forms, which is foreign films, are more associated with sexual themes, while the written medium is, is local. Be taken up for the further study. Fourth, the dimensionality of taboo and privacy is also a possible topic to take up for further study as it was seen that many are tolerating virtual temptation but never openly admitted it. It's like a taboo topic to all countries, most especially to Christian countries. Five, conduct further study to verify that results of the present undertakings. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, ma'am, for the presentation. I now welcome our last speaker for today's, I'm sorry, for today's technical one session. <laughs> okay, last speaker for today's technical one session. I would like to welcome Herson S. Cabrera to present prediction and analysis of epitopes from the human Marburg virus and immunoinformatics approach. Can we show the presentation, please? Hi again, everyone. So this is my second paper, and I'll be presenting a prediction and analysis of epitopes from the human Marburg virus and immune informatics approach 
Uh, this research was carried out by Maria Sabin Panganiban, my colleague, and myself. Next. And let me jump ahead to the next slide, please. So what is Marburg virus disease? So recently, in July 2022, I think, uh, the country of Ghana reported cases of Marburg uh, virus, although they declared this outbreak to be over last September 2022. So the epidemic is short-lived. However, uh, we want to be ready when it comes to when this um, disease will arise again. So that includes management practices in the health field and also in terms of vaccination. So what is the Marburg virus? The Marburg virus is a hemorrhagic fever virus uh, of the Filoviridae family of viruses, highly virulent and epidemic prone. Um, it was first actu uh, isolated in 1967 in the city of Marburg in uh, Germany. And as of now, there is no approved treatment available, including vaccination. Next. So as before, uh, the paper that I presented earlier, I'll be utilizing the same approach, which we call immune informatics. So again, what we did here is that we predicted epitopes from the pathogen, but this time it's a virus. Earlier, I uh, presented a parasite. So the protein that we utilize here, next slide. So there are three proteins actually. So the first one is the glycoprotein. So if you all know, glycoprotein is the protein that interacts to the receptor to the human cell. Same as SARS-CoV-2 or COVID, right? SARS-CoV-2 has the spike protein, that's why it's called coronavirus, but it's the same here with Marburg virus. It also has that protein and we consider that as virulent. Number two, the nucleoprotein which houses the genome of this virus. And third, the VP40 protein which is responsible for the assembly and release of viral particles once they infect the cell. Next. So what we did here is we incorporated all uh, antigens, all proteins, filtered out the epitopes that are not needed, meaning those that are toxic and allergic. We only incorporated those that are antigenic that will elicit an immune response. Next. And here I'm showing you the population coverage analysis that we did. First, for the B, uh, VP40 protein. So for the VP40 pro, uh, protein, uh, I have here for the blue, the MHC1, and for the orange, MHC2. So these are proteins, right? MHC1 are found on the surface of uh, all nucleated cells, meaning all cells with nucleus, right? While MHC2 is a protein that's only found on uh, antigen-presenting cells. So it turns out that for this protein, if we're going to derive epitope from here, the population coverage worldwide is only about 50%, although it's quite decent already. However, for the MHC2, the coverage is quite lower. But anyway, we have to combine the effect of both the epitope uh, that will be responsible for the interaction between uh, uh, for T cells, both helper and cytotoxic. Next. However, for the nucleoprotein, because the nucleoprotein houses the DNA, right? It's not exposed. So therefore, there's not much MHC2 coverage on the worldwide population. However, for the MHC1 coverage, we have around 70%. Okay, next, please. Um, we have to make sure that the epitopes that we derive from the proteins do not mutate much. Okay, and therefore we carried out what we call multiple sequence alignment and we randomly sampled isolates from different people all over the world and we found that the epitopes we determine from those proteins do not change much as you can see from the sequencing right so therefore those epitopes any vaccine that can be derived from that epitope will be uh will be received well by the population okay next and uh let's uh, skip that one because it's a repeat next please and uh, in this study, we assembled two vi uh, vaccine constructs. So the first one has a different epitope than the second one. So the first, so these are all made of the same epitopes from all those proteins. The difference is for the first vaccine construct, uh, we use the L7, L12 adjuvant, while the second one, we use the HABA adjuvant. So what will be the difference between these two vaccine constructs? Let's see, next slide. 
Okay, in terms of the B cell population, so B cells are cells that produce antibodies, right? And it turns out that for the second vaccine construct, it has a higher B cell population generated after exposure to our vaccine construct as compared to uh, V1. Also take note that V2 has higher antigenicity as compared to V1. Next, please. Uh, in terms of the helper T cell population, so as you can see, the difference is quite remarkable. So we have around uh, a population of 10,000 as compared to just 8,000 for the second vaccine construct. Okay, next. And here I'm showing you the physicochemical properties of the second vaccine construct, meaning is it stable? Is it thermostable? So yes, we calculated different indices such as instability index, aliphatic index, even the molecular weight. And we found that the vaccine construct that we were able to derive can be suitable for our purpose. Next. And in conclusion, a total of six uh, CD8 plus T cell epitopes, six CD4 plus T cell epitopes, actually that's helper T cells, and nine B cell epitopes were predicted and assessed from all three proteins. Two vaccine constructs were uh, assembled, each containing two different adjuvants, and it turns out that the second vaccine construct has a better performance in terms of number one, population coverage, number two, antigenicity, so it's thought to be more immunogenic, it will elicit more immune response, and lastly, as we have seen in the immune response simulation, it generated more B cells and more T cells as compared to the first one. And therefore, in conclusion, we have thus developed a vaccine which is not just multi-epitope, but rather also a multi-antigen. It can incorporate all those proteins in a single um, virus, and that will have, hopefully, a better performance, better effectivity against the Marburg virus disease. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for the presentation. We have now come to an end with technical session one. I would like to thank you for your time. Your presence has been very valuable today uh, for all our participants and viewers at physical and in virtual. It's now time for a refreshing break. I request everyone to please join us back by 5.20 p.m. so that we begin with our technical session two. Thank you so much. presentation
Kan.
After this, I cannot see you. I need to start this talking. This cannot. May I go back to hotel? Can you give me?
Hello. So at this juncture, we're going to award the certificate of <laughs> certificate of presentation. 
So allow me to read the text. Certificate of Presentation, World Conference on, on Multidisciplinary Research and Innovation, October 28, Singapore. Award this certificate to Professor Herson S. Cabrera of Mapua University. Oh, diba? Congratulations, sir. <laughs> Same certificate of presentation is awarded to same person, Professor Herson S. Cabrera. Ayan. May we call on sir to present the award. Sige, sir, please. Yes. Ma'am Same certificate of presentation is awarded to Ms. Michelle Lay S. Victorino of Lyceum of the Philippines University, Manila. Let's give her a round of applause. Diba? Ang dami natin. <laughs> Same certificate of presentation is awarded to Dr. Victor M. Cahalia of Asian Institute of Maritime Studies. Same certificate of presentation, WCMRI 2022 is awarded to Dr. Jonathan H. Marquez of City Schools Division of Cabuyao. Mauna po yung awarding, yes po. Ito po yung bagong ano ngayon, Fourth Industrial Awarding Ceremony. <laughs> Same certificate of presentation, WCMRI 2022 is awarded to Professor Husna T. Luma Penet of Cotabata Foundation College of Science and Technology. Same certificate of presentation is awarded to Please give us a moment. We have a technical issue. Ay, chokla. <laughs> How many have not received their certificate? One, then two. Dr. Cantillero also, my colleague, and... Ay ha. You can use one certificate. Yan. I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Hat, Dr. Tarhata S. Guyamalan to kindly receive your certificate. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Moving forward, we now begin with our technical session two. I request our participants to kindly please present your PPTs within five minutes to, and less than seven minutes. Okay, I call upon the names. I request our participants to please proceed forward. I would like to welcome Dr. Jonathan H. Marcus to present leadership and supervisory skills and change management practices among school heads.
Mabuhay a pleasant afternoon to the organizers as well as to my fellow attendees. I am Dr. Jonathan H. Marquez. Now my research topic is significant and relevant to my functions as education program supervisor in the city schools division of Kabuyao, Laguna, Philippines. Now my research is entitled Leadership and Supervisory Skills and Change Management Practices Among School Heads Basis for Strategic Plan Model. Next slide. It is evident that change is inevitable. Nations around the world are embracing and promoting wide range of educational reforms to meet the needs of today's living and to educate our learning leaders, teachers, students, for them to be prepared in, in facing the 21st century challenges. I am inspired by the passage given by Nelson Mandela, the late president of South Africa. He stated that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Okay, now education leaders as change agents play a pivotal role in promoting an accessible, liberating, and quality education. Principles functions such as directing, supervising, managing, communicating, and utilizing resources can support or disrupt the transformation process. Now, in the Philippines, in the elementary and secondary education, uh, the principals have those functions. They can make or unmake the school, the process in the school. We all know that principals are the ones who lead, oversee, conduct professional development and school-based trainings and utilize resources to realize the mantra of DepEd. Department of Education. And what is the mantra or the advocacy? That is to produce lifelong learners. 
And this would be possible if we produce quality teachers managed by the school principals. For them to, to provide quality instruction. Now, next slide, please. Next slide. The study underscored the relationship among public elementary school heads' leadership styles, supervisory skills, and change management practices as perceived by the teachers and school heads themselves in the city schools division of Kabuyao. The findings of this research led to the development of a strategic plan model geared towards the improvement of school governance in public schools. Now, as you can see, we have here three variables, such as leadership styles. So I identified the leader leadership styles used by the school heads or school principals, such as transformational, transactional, laissez fair, authoritarian, and or democratic. Now, in terms of supervisory skills, uh, covered curriculum and instructional uh, supervision, organization and personal development management, planning and assessing teaching and learning outcomes, school plan resources and facilities management, and school community linkages. Next slide. Next slide. By the way, the respondents of this study were the 12 full-pledged school principals in the elementary and 228 teachers. A sequential exploratory technique was utilized. The data collected in this study were utilized using weighted mean, Pearson, R, and T test. Now, please go back to the previous slide. Okay, description. The study highlighted the impact of leadership, supervisory skills, as well as change management practices as the basis for strategic plan model among the 21st century school principals aiming to facilitate an effective and efficient performance of their instructional and administrative functions using transformative leadership style. Actually, it is expected that a principal has to devote 70% in the instruction and 30% of the administrative. Now, moreover, this likewise disclosed significant and driven themes of empowerment, communication and collaboration among internal and external stakeholders, balanced application of tasks and people-oriented principles, utilization of ICT to close, to close learning gaps and achieve literacy, and implementation of change management practices with an emphasis on students' progress and teachers' performance. Next. Next slide, please. Now, based on the findings, I come up with the following conclusions. Number one, the vast majority of respondents were women who were new to the profession of educational management. Actually, only 60% of school heads in this study. Number two, the school principals employed transformational leadership style as assessed by the teachers and school heads themselves. Number three, the leadership style of school heads as observed by teachers and by the school leaders themselves do not significantly correlate. Number four, the school heads were effective in terms of their supervisory skills, 
which were evident in the data gathered and assessment base made by the respondents of the study. Number five, the teachers agreed and remark strongly agree among school heads in carrying their supervisory skills. Number six, next slide. Next slide. Okay, number six. The school heads or principals effectively implemented the change management practices in instruction as perceived by the teachers and school heads themselves. Number seven, the supervisory skills of the school heads had affected their ways of change management practices, which seemed to be agreeable among teachers. Number nine, the school heads greatly influence the performance and achievements of students as well as teachers as assessed by the respondents. Lastly, the strategic plan was developed to address the issues and concerns relative to the improvement and implementation of the school head's leadership styles, supervisory skills, and change management practices. Now, next slide. I have there the photos during the provision of technical assistance among school heads based on the results and recommendations of the study. So thank you and mabuhay. Thank you, sir, for the presentation. I would now like to welcome Onfrey S. Corpus to present cultural management practices and conservation strategies on upland rice production. Welcome, sir. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I am Dr. Onapri S. Corpus, the uh, concurrent vice president for research, development, and extension of the Cotabato Foundation College of Science and Technology. At the same time, uh, a college professor in uh, uh, position. Uh, the title of my paper, of our people, is Cultural Management Practices and Conservation Strategies on Upland Rice Production. This is actually a, a study conducted to uh, uh, determine the uh, different uh, farming practices of the indigenous people as well as their strategies in conserving uh, the upland rice. Next slide, please. please. Uh, upland rice uh, farming is just a second uh, commercial uh, cropping methods in the Philippines because uh, we uh, usually uh, uh, cultivate our uh, rice in uh, lowland or irrigated uh, areas. This is uh, also true that the uh, upland rice areas are being uh, uh, converted to uh, permanent crops, especially in Mindanao, such as rubber, banana, coconut, oil palms, and other uh, uh, crops that are permanent in nature. Uh, the area of the research is in Arakan Valley conflicts, that is in uh, North Cotabato, uh, found in the south uh, central part of Mindanao, Philippines. And uh, uh, the uh, method of 
study that are used in this particular study is the uh, descriptive correlational uh, uh, methods thereby the uh, researcher are or used uh, questionnaire in getting uh, data and uh, this uh, the response of response of the uh, farmers were uh, uh, correlated through uh, regression uh, correlation or the so-called influence statistics next slide please next slide okay for the result of the study on uh, management practices for uh, variety selection it was found out that uh, only uh, two farming practices uh, is the highly practiced such as on farm selection considering uh, bigger and uh, healthy uh, panicles of the rice plant as well as use of personally stored seeds meaning uh, farmers are not buying uh, seeds for uh, the uh, for their farm they rely on the seeds that are being stored by them next slide please the rest are actually moderately uh, practice next slide please so for a seed and okay for land preparation it was uh, noted here that uh, slashing is the most uh, prevalent uh, practice of the farmers uh, they just moderately practice clearing the area with the use of herbicide zero tillage burning grasses or the so-called kaying in the philippines and swallow uh, shallow tillage so with this uh slashing of the grasses is the most uh, or highly practiced by the respondent the farmer respondent next slide please for the land preparation uh, only one among the different uh, uh, farm practices on land preparation reported to be highly practiced and that is hand weeding the rest are uh, moderately practiced such as uh, using uh, herbicides to uh, eradicate weeds by uh, spraying use of fertilizer use of organic uh, fertilizer as well use of uh, pesticide to control uh, damage caused by uh, pest this is actually pest uh, management not uh, land preparation pest management that is being practiced by the uh, farmer upland rice farmer so meaning the farmer are uh, keeping their farm uh, pre of pest by the use of uh, uh, hand weeding they just maintain the uh, uh, clean cleanliness of the uh, area through uh, removing of the, the weeds by hand weeding next slide please this is a farm practices uh, on uh, pest uh, control no? and uh, all of the uh, practices are found to be moderately practiced such as use of traps use of pesticides use of indigenous materials to trap uh, insects scaring birds and uh,
नेक्स्ट लाइव टाइम ना ओके मे बी ओके फॉर द कंक्लूजन ऑफ दिस स्टडी इट वाज फाउंड आउट थ्रू इन्फ्लुएंस स्टैटिस्टिक्स दैट ओनली द सिलेक्शन ऑफ वैरायटीज एस वेल एस दैट ऑफ मार्केटिंग इस positively uh, related or significantly related to the uh, practices as well as on the, the uh, strategies on the conservation of the uh, upland rice thank you thank you so much sir i would now like to welcome tarhata s guiamelan to present internship in times of pandemic a qualitative phenomenological study welcome ma'am Yeah. That's okay. No. That's not. Okay. Good afternoon Singapore. Dr. Tarhata S. Gemalon, the Dean of the Graduate School of the Cotabato State University. So the title of my paper is Internship in Times of Pandemic, a Qualitative Phenomenological Study. Next slide, please. This study focuses on exploring how pre-service teachers experience their internship in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic. So the pre-service teachers are asked to describe their experiences during times of pandemic using a phenomenological research design. Next slide. The participants in this study were 22 pre-service teachers in the day class section of the Bachelor of Technical Livelihood Education program major in industrial arts of the CSUC TED. Then the, the new normal of pandemic preventions and control has caused these respondents to adapt to new internship and deployment conditions. Next slide, please. So this is, this is Cotabato City. The Cotabato State University is a state-owned university located in Cotabato City, Philippines. And we cater most of the students from remote municipalities in South Central Mindanao. So CSU is envisioned to be a world-class development hub for sustainable, inclusive, and transformative peace and development in Southern Philippines through its mandated functions, the instruction, research, extensions, and productions. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. One of its academic units is the College of Teacher Education. It offers Bachelor of Technology and Livelihood Education with two majors, the Industrial Arts and the Home Economics with its major requirements of pre-service teaching and that is internship. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. The students will acquire with these programs the students will acquire knowledge, skills, and foundation education necessary for practicing as a teacher. Second, acquire skills and knowledge in specialized training. Third, students will understand how learning processes contribute to learning outcomes. Next slide. Also, the students will acquire knowledge, skills, and foundation necessary for practicing as a teacher. As, uh, Adapt a variety of teaching methods that will ensure effective learning in any environment, maintain and apply ethical professional standards, and lastly, gain appropriate training in extension research in order to engage in effective and workable programs related to community outreach. Next slide.
Next slide, please. Yeah. And adopt a variety of teaching methods that will ensure. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, next. Okay, so the purpose of this study is essential to explore how pre service te teachers experience their internship in the midst of COVID 19 pandemic. Next, next slide. Okay, so these are the summary of the, uh, the results. So teaching in these limited times brought mixed feelings among pre-service teachers as they practice and applied theories. They have learned new roles and responsibilities of pre-service teachers are rapidly evolving as a result of the pedagogical adoptions from physical to virtual environments. Second, they need to be creative and adapt their practices to keep students engaged regardless of what struggles they are facing. Nurturing professional identities involves adapting new ways of improving teaching skills through the use of technology. Next slide, please. Hi, next slide. Okay, Practic practicum is challenging when it comes to the internet connection because our students are from the remote uh, areas. In fact, we all know that students who don't have access to internet at home still don't have funding of it. Okay. Then to cope with the struggles during internship in the new normal, pre-service teachers can take initiative. The ability to manage urgent situations immediately and avoid for, uh, falling behind when unexpected events occur could be achieved through time management. Establishing good relationship with students and colleagues can lead to productive and effective work. Pre-service teachers may ex-host, frustrated and sad, but this is a temporary and uncertain situation. Next slide, please. It is always grateful to six assistants, according, uh, according to the participants from mentors, who wish to improve their mentees in new ways. When they look at how technology develops knowledge, competence, and pedag pedagogical skills, they see that it provides them with easy to access information, accelerated learning, and enjoyable opportunities to practice learned theories. They now have access to a broader range of knowledge and they believe that technological advancement, innovations related experiences have been linked to, next slide please. Okay. Pre-service teachers should learn how to apply their knowledge and abilities by considering fundamental modern conditions, communications, teamwork, problem solving and decision making. Pre-service teachers benefited from the intervening learning environment in the new normal. They learn to value their time and are encouraged to commit to a lifelong learning process because learning a new skill is a great way to stay motivated. They learn to navigate themselves by determining the best time to push themselves beyond their comfort zone. They recognize the value of a growth-oriented mindset and their self-directed learning plan is tailored to their primarily uh, primary learning objectives. Next slide. Then the conclusion, the new normal has brought challenges, but it has also created a sense of adventure for pre-service teachers. Their experience has of has provided them with valuable knowledge and skills. In order to develop their self-worth and self-efficacy as a pre-service teachers, it is imperative that they are technologically literate to move through any practicum process they may encounter, whether it be online or offline, as they progress through their practicum program. That's all, thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for the presentation. I would now like to welcome Dr. Valin Giri to present Meta Galaxy. Thank you. 
Todo es cristiano. Todo es cristiano. Todo es cristiano. Ok, ready? Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Who we are, where we came from, what is existing with us? Only these three questions. We are life. We are came from from this place. The life. The God, the matter, these three are internal things. This total place is Maya. It's called Maya. In this meta Maya or meta galaxy or meta world, 216 elements are existing. Each and every element creating its own universe. So that we, we have 216 types of universe, not 216 universe, types of worlds. Where we are, this is a big thing. Where we are, please listen here, the, this place only. The scientists start telling the universe, 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 this, only this part. This, in this part, only six universes are existing. Only six universes are existing. The major elements, only six. Another 210 elements are from here only. Up to this one, 108. Here, 54. Third base, 27. 18. Last base, 5. Second one, 9. Repeating. First base, 108. Second base, 56. Then, 27. Then, 18. Then, 9. From here, we are from Third type, 27. Fourth type, 18 type, 18, 18. Then, 9. From here, the life, the God, and the matter. From here, existing. It is coming from there only. They never get lost. Another two minutes. Will you give uh, one minute? In this life, what? How many? In this life, I told in the morning, eighty-four lakh species are there. And in this life, men are nine nine lakh types. 
human, not men, human type, only 9 lakhs. We will, we can live up to 84, 864, 864 years. In this 864, it divided by 123. In 123, you can live according to your star. Minimum age is 83 to 100. Another 23 years is, it will go in the poor logos, poor logos. Thank you for your listen. This is a great version. It, it cannot be tell within a few seconds. At least you take this picture and verify. The, I showed this place only. We are living. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. I would now like to welcome our last participant for today's technical two session. I would like to welcome Dr. John Robbie to present implementation of internal, internalization practices vis a vis school culture of quality. Um, good afternoon, every, uh, good evening, everyone. So please give me two minutes to present my study. By the way, my name is John Robert Robinas. I'm the Dean of the Humanities and Social Sciences and the Dean of the College of Arts, Sciences, and Education of the University of Perpetual Health System, Delta Molino Campus. So my topic is all about internationalization vis-a-vis -vis school culture of quality. All right, so here's my title. So the main idea actually of this paper is about the possible impact that internationalization practices can give to the higher education institutions, particularly the provision of um, school culture of quality. So it is anchored to CMO number 55, series of 2016, which is all about internationalization of higher education, which discusses two um, pillars, the home-based internationalization practices and the cross-border internationalization practices. It is also anchored to the idea of how we define school culture of quality. First definition is about fitness of purpose. The second one is exceeding to the standards. And the third one is um, gearing towards uh, school culture of quality. And this is limited to two ideas, the teaching and learning and then the leadership and management. So the main goal is again to establish if there's an impact of the internationalization practices to attainment of school culture of quality. So as for the methodology, I use quantitative inferential. There are 147 participating students, faculty, and administrators from three autonomous performing universities in the national capital region, namely Southville International School, of course, our main campus, the Perpetual Delta Campus, and the Ateneo de Manila University. I used researcher-made survey. This is a validated. I use SPS version 24. So there's a 0.94 Cronbach Alpha reliability. And then the data gathering is conducted through Google Forms, and then I use ANOVA t-test, regression analysis for the impact. So what's the result for home-based? All home-based initiatives are uh, successfully implemented. This is more on the initiatives of the school in implementing internationalization efforts, particularly um, conduct of internationalization ideas and the content of internationalization to the curriculum. For the cross-border, it is just generally implemented because later on I will be mentioning which um, initiative uh, lacks no, in our in the different universities. Um, it is well noted that um, teaching and learning and leadership and management are highly observed in terms of culture of quality in the different universities. 
um, there is a significant differences in terms of the implementation of home-based initiatives and cross-border um, efforts among the three participating universities. However, for the level of cultural quality, there's no differences. Now, this shows that um, the implementation of home-based and cross-border cross internationalization initiatives is actually related to the attainment of quality culture in terms of teaching and learning and leadership and management. So, it highlighted that internationalization really impact the attainment of school culture of quality. This is actually the main paradigm that was crafted based from the output of the based from the findings of the study. So it says here that through cross-border and home-based initiatives, then we can attain the destination of having culture of quality. So given the idea that in in, in the in the home-based initiatives of each university, the the integration of cultural and ethnic um, ethnic perspective is the least generally observed, so therefore the study recommend to strengthen the implementation of activities related to this um, initiative. Same is true with the cross-border. It's more on provision of twinning programs across the countries, um, and it's about academic franchising. And of course, I highly recommend that considering the revision of this paper, we can have the top neighboring um, international schools such as the University of Tokyo, the National University of Singapore, um, University of Hong Kong for a more comprehensive details of how internationalization initiatives can impact school culture of quality. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. We now come to an end of technical session two. I would like to express a heartfelt thank you to all our guests and participants in the day one conference on behalf of IFERP. The conference, which has been a huge success and included as its motto, discover the difference and exceeding the vision in multidisciplinary research studies, featured eminent keynote speakers from multiple universities. I appreciate the kind response and active participation of all our members of the organizing committee and editorial board. We are grateful to thank all of our speakers, delegates, participants, and attendees for their crucial support and time for the WC MRI 2022. Furthermore, I would like to thank everyone who took part. Stay tuned with us for the day two conference. You can participate virtually too. This is Shifa Tazin, hereby signing off. Thank you and wishing you all a pleasant stay in Singapore. Thank you.